KKM Productions presents McKnight's Memory. He was being summoned out of the darkness, but he did not recognize the name that he was being called by, nor the voice that was calling him. McKnight! Come on! Wake up, McKnight! You'll be okay. But we have to get to cover. McKnight tried to focus on the blurred figure that was kneeling over him. The first things he could make out were the three yellow letters on the man's blue windbreaker. C-I-A. He could now see the face clearly, but he didn't recognize it. He felt himself being grabbed and dragged. It was only slightly discomforting to him, and even a distraction from the pain of his head wound, which was now dripping blood onto his shoulder and his chest. He instinctively reached up to where the pain was located. No, no, don't touch that. You'll be okay. The bullet just grazed your head. I've got a medic on the way. McKnight focused his eyes on the turmoil that was happening down the street of the small village. Men wearing CIA windbreakers were firing pistols and M16s at the primitive houses. They were taking positions on the right side of the street and returning fire to the left side. Okay, we made it to cover. Let's stay here and wait for the medic. Where are we? We're in Colombia. Operation Sidewinder. It's me, Lidecker. Don't you remember? Things are a little... Um, fuzzy now. How bad am I hurt? The bullet grazed your head, I think. It's a superficial wound. You lost a little blood, but not too much. I can't get a grip on what's going on. Fill me in. Would you, what, what's this about? We're here to destroy a large drug operation. Don't you know? What uh, am I doing here? You're in charge. Look, uh, m Mr. It's Lidecker. Lidecker! Look, Lidecker, I can't seem to focus on what's happened to me since you woke me up. I don't know my, uh, I don't. Jeez, I don't know my name. Your name is James McKnight. The medic's here. Hang on. Head wound, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I think it just grazed his head. Oh, yeah. Looks like it. Maybe not too bad. I'll just bandage him up until this thing is over. How do you feel, sir? Not good. Head pain. Nauseous. Listen, um, I don't know anything. Can't uh, remember anything. Hold still, sir. Let me get this around you and tie it off, and then we can get you out of here. Okay, there you go. Oh, Jesus. He's, he's dead. Where's our cover? What the hell is going on here? You'd better get us out of here. I can't. I, I, I can't do it. No, no, don't look at me, McKnight. This is your operation, your plans. I'm... In no shape to handle anything. Are you next in command? You know I am. I don't know anything, but if you are, you better get us all out of here. My first responsibility is your safety. I'm going to put you in a jeep so you can take off. Can you walk? I, I, I think I can. Okay, let's head down to the vehicles. It doesn't look good for the men. They're going down one by one. You let me worry about the operation from here on. Let's make a run for the jeep. I'll give you cover. You hop in the jeep and drive off in the direction it's pointed in. It should be clear sailing. Drive off to where? There's a rendezvous point about five clicks down the road. Don't you worry about that. I'll gather up the men and we'll catch up with you in a few minutes. There's not many men to gather up. I just saw another one get hit. God damn, drug brothers. Anyway, don't worry about the men. You just get yourself safely down the road. Come on, let's hit it. The two men ran to the jeep. Lidecker quickly pushed McKnight up into a seat. The keys were in the ignition, and he quickly brought the engine to life. He popped the clutch, sending the vehicle rocketing down the road while he hung on to the steering wheel. 
In the side mirror, McKnight could see Lidecker standing in front of the village, clouded in black smoke from the burning houses. Soon, he turned a bend in the road, and Lidecker disappeared from view. Back in the village, the bodies of the drug-running Colombians and CIA agents made a morgue of the street. Bodies in various grotesque positions were waiting for the buzzards to arrive, circle, and descend on them. Lidecker turned and surveyed the scene of the massacre. He felt he had pulled off Operation Sidewinder perfectly. All the deaths had come off dramatically and, most important, realistically. He then pulled the walkie-talkie from his belt and spoke into it confidently. The pigeon is away. Mission complete. I repeat, the pigeon is away. Mission complete. Let's get the hell out of here. The dead men began to rise. All the Colombian corpses and the CIA corpses got up off the dirt street where they had been lying and waiting for the signal that would bring them back to life. They began to walk over to the vehicles and prepare for leaving the scene that they had so perfectly created. Lidecker looked around the village, nodding, and then down the road where McKnight had driven. This better work, or I'm a dead man. McKnight drove along the winding road surrounded by large fields on the left and jungles on the right. Confident in his escape, he began asking himself questions. But even the easy ones had no answers. Rendezvous point? What the hell did that guy say about a rendezvous point? Nothing but deserted road in front of me. My hands are on the steering wheel. Don't recognize him. How old are they? What's my age? Wait, I know. Rearview mirror. Here I am. Who is that? Me. Not so young. What, 40, 42 years old? Have I got a wallet? An ID? Driver's license? Huh. Yeah. Here. My CIA ID card, James McKnight. My birthday, year. What year is this? Oh, could I remember that? Let's see, I'm 56 or 7. Jesus, I woke up today and I'm already 57. What's this? Photo. Beautiful Asian woman. Seems like I should know her. Can't quite remember. What is she to me? Okay, no time for this. Gotta move. Meet up with the CIA. Where? McKnight put the wallet back in his pocket. Wondering what the weight on the side of his chest was, he reached inside his jacket. He felt the 2.2 pounds of iron strapped to his side. He hadn't noticed the weight of his 38 Special until now, what with the day's distractions. But there it was, two-inch barrel and all. Had he even fired it today? Opening it, he checked the back to see if there were any firing pinholes in the primers. There were none. None had been fired. Jesus, some agent I am. Injured before firing a shot, deserting my men, leaving them to die. I'm just like that French guy at the Alamo who climbed over the wall at night before the last attack. What was his name? McKnight replaced the weapon, put the jeep in gear, and drove on. As the bumpy dirt road moved beneath him, he racked his mind for one familiar person in his past. A mailman, a next-door neighbor, anyone. But no face came to him. But that photo that he had tucked back into his wallet ever so gently, the photo of that beautiful Asian woman with the raven hair kept coming up in his mind, superimposing itself over the road in front of him like a heads-up display. He did know her, didn't he? He had seen that flawless face before, that confident half-smile, the dark, 
sparkling eyes that seemed to look out of the photo right at him. She looked to be about 35 or 6. His mind called out to her. Who are you? I know you, I think. Are you my wife? Waiting somewhere? As no answer was forthcoming, McKnight let his brain rest and merely guided the jeep around the curves in the road ahead. McKnight was now driving on fumes. The needle in the gas gauge had long since passed the E mark. Almost an hour had elapsed since he had fled from that village and he hadn't seen anything that looked like a rendezvous point. Just fields, banana trees, small farms with two or three shabbily dressed field hands working them. The sputtering of the engine lasted only a few seconds. Then only silence came from the engine as the jeep rolled to a stop. Oh, great. Now I'm really screwed. What do I do now? No choice. Just have to keep moving. Let's see. Any water in the Jeep? Extra ammo? Anything? Snake bite kit would be in order from the look of this place. Oh. What the hell? I got my little pistola. That'll take care of any pain in the ass snakes. Okay. Best foot forward, as they say. Once more into the breach. A few miles later, on foot, the curvy road began to straighten and slope uphill to a ridge that was about a quarter mile ahead. McKnight's legs tightened as he began the upward and onward trek. What was that sound? Something coming. Oh, hell. What's that? Jeep full of long-haired, bandana-wearing assholes. Drug runners. Three of them, all armed. Two pistols, one rifle. They do a drive-by, shoot me, rob me. What do I do? Pull my pistol now, wait till later. Shit, that's no good. I could maybe get one or two of them, but the last one would kill me sure as hell. Better keep it holstered, hope for the best. Bluff it. Hey, amigo. Are you all right? I'm fine. Nice day. Oh, it's a goddamn hot day. We need a goddamn roof in this thing. And you know, you don't look so goddamn fine. Oh, this. I just rolled my Jeep down the road. Uh, hit my head, that's all. Aha. Uh -huh. See, and? Well, I'm just waiting for some friends. They're coming right along. Oh, I didn't see anyone on the road back there. Oh, yeah, Eduardo. Did we pass anyone back there? No, we passed no one. Except when you were sleeping. No, you weren't sleeping. We didn't pass nobody. Y sabe que? I didn't see anyone either. And who the hell are you, Jose? Just sit there and pay attention. Si, sí, como no, jefe. You know, you are the first gringo that I have seen in foot in my country. I think it is so strange. And you know, every gringo I see is carrying at least one gun. But you look like you have no guns at all. Looks can be deceiving, amigo mío. ¿Qué fue lo que dijo? No reconozco esa palabra. No estoy seguro, pero pienso que tiene miedo. Quiere bloquearlos. Uh, ¿Qué tú crees? ¿No los echamos? Sí, ¿por qué no? No va a haber problema. Well, I guess I better see what's keeping my friends. Well, you know what, señor? I don't think you have any friends coming. I think you think we mean to rob you. I think you think we mean to kill you and rob you. I never thought of that. Oh, no? Well, then you either very crazy or very stupid. But I'll tell you what. I will take a chance and you will not kill you. We just want the money in your pocket and maybe I think you have a weapon or knife or something. So before the money, you give us the weapon to make us all friends. I don't have a weapon. Oh, senor. You better find one, or I will tell this one here to put another hole in your head to match the one you got on now. Yes. One on the left side of your head to match the pretty red one you got on your right side. Well, I have to go. Oh, no, senor. You stand right there, and we will... 
Knight was amazed how fast his reflexes were when he grabbed his pistol and pulled it out of the shoulder holster. He was so fast that he caught the Colombians completely by surprise. But now McKnight stood frozen, pistol still aimed at the three, because his brain couldn't handle what he was seeing. The leader was still standing half in shock, searching his body for wounds where there were none. His two partners were doing the same. They hadn't been touched by even one of McKnight's bullets. They looked at each other to see if any of them had been hit. When they saw they hadn't been so much as nicked, the Colombians pulled their own weapons on McKnight, cocking them. McKnight ducked down to the ground. With his eyes closed, he missed the sight of the bandit leader being hit square in the chest with a high-velocity hollow point that shattered and spread inside his body. It knocked the bandit back down into his seat, which then bounced him headfirst into the windshield, sending slivers and cracks through it. The other two bandits looked up to see the approaching military helicopter with a marksman seated halfway out of the open door, taking aim for his second shot. The bandit driver quickly dropped his weapon and put the jeep in gear just before he was hit on his left side with another hollow point round that painted the cracked windshield red. His foot sprang off the clutch. The jeep lurched forward, knocking the bandit standing in the rear over the rear edge of the vehicle. McKnight looked up in time to see the remaining bandit hitting the back of the head that had the same effect that a 4th of July cherry bomb would have if ignited inside a rotten apple. McKnight jerked his eyes away from the falling mess, almost feeling sorry for the last of the predators to be executed by an aerial firing squad of one. Stay right there, McKnight. We'll have you out of here in a minute. The helicopter hovered gently in for a landing. McKnight was engulfed in the wind, the dust, the noise, and the vibration created by its throbbing engine and blades. Louis Rose. What? That's the man's name. Louis Rose. Who's that? I suddenly remember the name of the Frenchman who climbed over the wall of the Alamo before the final battle. His name was Louis Rose. And he's a lot like me, the only survivor from a... What was it? Operation Sidewinder. The Alamo, huh? <laughs> For a man who claims to have lost his memory, you're, you're coming up with some pretty strange stuff. Yeah. It's always irrelevant stuff like that. Everything but who I am, where I live, and what I'm doing here. Well, you're damn lucky that we found you in time. Yeah. Those bandits had me dead to rights. You're lucky the helicopter found you, you know. Uh, Agent Lidecker's a hell of a marksman. Three out of three shots from a moving helicopter at 200 yards? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I wish I could have seen that. I wish I'd missed it. But remind me to thank him if you run into him. He's sitting right over there. Hey, Lidecker, you sure shot the hell out of those bandits. Just did my job. I'm not happy about it. The hell with those three. They deserve what they got for trying to do in our boss here. Mr. Lidecker, I'm sorry you had to do that, but I appreciate your help. Without your good aim, I'm afraid I wouldn't be here. I did what was necessary. No need to thank me. Lidecker is something uncommon in our special ops department. An agent with a conscience. <laughs> that, that can be a problem. That's right, Bishop. Now let's just hope I have enough for the two of us. And that's why you and I make such a great team, Lidecker. You with a conscience and me with none. I think the department better start getting a conscience. You know, it's a wonder that you can do all this high-level theoretical thinking and still remain only a GS-11. You let me worry about that, Bishop. Excuse me, gentlemen, I haven't slept in two days. I'm gonna catch up. In any case, Agent Lidecker, I want to thank you for my life. Right. Yeah, my life. Where in the hell did I put it? You remember the helicopter picking you up, don't you? Yeah, of course. And getting bandaged up again and put on this Learjet? Clear as a bell. Well, there you go. I still can't remember who I am. I told you who you are. You're, you're James McKnight, Chief of Special Operations for the CIA, specializing in black ops. You say that as if I should know what it is. Sure you do. Propaganda, rigging elections in foreign countries, coup d'etats and assassinations. And busting up drug rings in Colombia. Well, that, that was a special deal you had us do. Sort of a favor to drug enforcement. So what the hell, now they owe us a favor. Anyway, pal, just sit tight, get some sleep. 
We'll be in Washington before you know it. Uh, say, uh, let me show you something. I got it here in my wallet. Hold on. Do you know her? Yeah. Oh, Carla. Sure. But I don't think anyone can really know Carla. Perhaps not even you. Well, who is she? You mean you don't even remember her? Man, that bullet really did do a job on you. You'd think I'd remember anyone so beautiful. You'd think. So what is she to me? Carla is... Well, she's your woman. A, a girlfriend. A, well, what do you call it? A, a lover. Christ, she lives with you. I almost remember her, but not in Washington. Well, you met her in Washington. That's all I know. Uh, I guess I better start remembering her. I would say that you damn well better start remembering her, and a few other things as well. Front office is not gonna like this botched-up operation. You're gonna have to report on that. How can I when I can't remember that? Well, I've got you set up for a few days in the hospital for a quick checkover, and then a week's leave to recuperate after that. It's Q&A big time with you on the receiving end of some pretty important cues. But for now, I... Relax. Put yourself into the hospital staff's hands. And Carla? Yeah. <laughs> put yourself into her hands as well. Might be better than the hospital to jog your memory. Put myself into the hands of a stranger. Well, I wouldn't know myself. But Carla's hand, stranger or not, is nothing to be afraid of. Well, anyway, get some shut-eye. We've still got a few hours before we hit Washington. Yeah. And before Washington hits me... McKnight let the hum and vibration of the jet engines lull him to sleep. It was McKnight's second night in Walter Reed Hospital. He turned over in his bed in a private room. He had been examined by a young doctor who said his head wound was healing nicely. He had put some salve on it and said that the bandage wasn't necessary anymore. McKnight had hoped Carla would come to visit him, not that he could remember her or anything else, but she hadn't showed. He had hoped that she would be the key to healing his void of mind, a mind that was again now drifting off to sleep, giving itself rest. However, there was no rest for his subconscious, which immediately came to the forefront and began reeling off a drama, like a projectionist reels one off on a movie screen. In this dream, McKnight found himself in a lecture room, the type you'd find in any college, except for the fact that there were CIA men wearing blue windbreakers seated there instead of students. There was a professor standing at the head of the class in front of a rear projection screen that was showing photos of the siege of the Alamo rendered in black and white drawings. McKnight had no time to wonder what the 1836 battle between the Texicans and Santa Ana's army had to do with the CIA, because he was suddenly transported to the lecturer's position, as dreams have a way of doing. In that position, McKnight had no choice but to continue the lecture. A lecture that he had no trouble giving as the information of the Alamo battle came to him like a returning friend. The Colonel William Barrett Travis was killed near the beginning of the pre-dawn siege on the Alamo. Jim Bowie was bayoneted, lying sick in his quarters. And according to the diary of one of Santa Ana's officers, Davy Crockett and a handful of Texans survived the battle. They were brought up before General Santa Ana and put to death by firing squad. Suddenly, McKnight's body went numb as he saw the CIA agents disappear. Appearing in their places were 20 Colombians looking exactly like the ones he saw in that village. In the front row of students, he saw the three bandits that had stopped him on the road. They looked half dead with their wounds still bleeding. The bandit leader stood and addressed McKnight. Oiga, amigo, that was no fair using a helicopter against us. That sniper killed me and my friend pretty damn good. If it wasn't for him, we would have killed you and robbed you and left you on the road. But no, now look at us. 
The light from the rear projection screen changed as a new graphic of the Alamo came up on it. McKnight looked back at it and saw a drawing of Davy Crockett with five other survivors lined up against the wall with a firing squad aiming at them. McKnight turned back to see that the drug runners were gone. In their places stood 20 Mexican soldiers direct from Santana's army. One soldier drew his sword and yelled a command at the others. The soldiers raised their muskets and aimed at McKnight. Soldados, listos. Apunte! Dispare! The hot flaming lead balls flew toward McKnight in slow motion. Their slow speed gave him time to start straining his eyes open. His eyes that were lying asleep in the hospital. Just before the musket balls began their flesh piercing and bone breaking, a light began to flare out the firing squad, sending them back into his subconscious from where they had come. McKnight awoke in his hospital room with the sunshine streaming through the window. Jesus, God, what was that about? Well, I see your head wound is looking good, Mr. McKnight. And what about the headaches? Just mild ones, Doc. Not bad, I guess, considering. Good. And your memory? Anything? No, nothing. Not a goddamn thing. I remember general facts, TV commercials, places, you know, stuff like that. Nothing about my life, nothing about myself. I'm sure it's only temporary. Give it a few more days and within a couple of weeks, your memories should return one by one. Slowly at first and then increasing quickly. You know, like popcorn. Yeah, popcorn, terrific. As I explained to Mr. Bishop, you have psychogenic amnesia which means except for your past, your mind is completely functional. Therefore, it's just a matter of reintroducing yourself to your life. And how do I do that? It's not as difficult as you might think. Just being around family and friends, looking at photos, work records, and other documents will help you fill in the blanks nicely. It sounds good. I hope so. To avoid the usual discharge hassles, Mr. McKnight, I've arranged for Mr. Bishop to sign you out. Good. And, uh, thank you, Doctor. A few minutes later, McKnight and Bishop came out of the elevator and into the hospital lobby. Uh, here we go, Jimbo. A few more steps and you're out of here. Yeah, none too soon for me. Enough of this hospital. Front door's right over there. I'll walk you out and then let you go on your own from there. Whoa, wait a minute. Hmm. Let me go where? Haven't you forgotten something? Not remembering who I am is only one of my problems. I don't know where I live. I don't know this city or how to get around. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not to worry. That's all been taken care of. Then what's the plan? Do I get a couple of days of freedom and then get creamed by the director of the CIA, whoever that is? Hey, don't worry about that for now. It's not going to be as bad as you think. He'll ask a few questions, you'll give him a few answers, and, well, that should hopefully take care of it. What if I don't know the answers by then? What if he thinks my memory loss is, is a lie? Just something I'm using as an excuse to cover up my mistake in Columbia. Hey, hey, look, you, you may have overexceeded your authority slightly, but you didn't break any laws, so he can't take your pension away from you. He could pressure you to retire, but you've been talking about retiring for quite a while, so what the hell, it's no big deal. Take the pension and run. Your memory will probably be coming back in a couple of days like the doc said, so don't sweat it. Until it does come back, I am sweating it. Okay, here we go. Back into the real world. Well, how do you like her? Who, what are you talking about? Look over there. The limousine. Yeah, it's all yours for the rest of the day. It's very nice. But, uh, to tell you the truth, for the last few days, I was hoping for something a little more feminine. Ah, so you do remember something. You, you forgot everything but your woman. Is that it? I remember the photo in my wallet, and that's all. But since she hasn't visited me here or even phoned, I was hoping she'd meet me here. Mm-hmm. Well, just keep your eye on the limo. McKnight saw the driver open the passenger door. 
A female figure came out of the limo. Her black hair framed a flawless Asian face that was sensual beyond any description McKnight could think of. Seeing McKnight, she smiled and waved. Bishop eyed McKnight, watching him take a very large breath of air. So how about it? Remember her? She is beautiful. Mm. And she's all yours. You take it from here, buddy. I'll call you later. Right. Thanks. Bishop gave Carla a quick wave, then turned and went back into the hospital. Carla ran up to McKnight, and she threw her arms around him. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Jim. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm... well, I'm... I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm just happy to see you, that's all. But this hospital thing had me worried. What did they tell you? Nothing, as usual. When you didn't return on Friday, like you said, I called your office. They said that you'd be spending a couple of days in the hospital for a checkup. I called the hospital, but you weren't registered. So I just waited. And Bishop called and said a limousine would pick me up and take me to you. I wondered why you didn't call. I wondered the same thing about you. <laughs> Come on, let's get you back home. So, you don't know anything about what happened? Just that you were going out of town for a couple of days like you told me. What did happen? Get in. I'll tell you what I know, which isn't much. What's this on the side of your head? Oh, a slight wound or so they tell me. Picked it up in Colombia. Is it okay to talk about where you've been? You never used to talk about your job. I don't know. I wasn't told not to, but since it's the only thing in my life right now that I do remember, I will talk about it with you. Maybe you can fill me in on some things. Where to, sir? Uh, uh, I don't know. Take us back home. And give us some privacy, please. Yes, ma'am. Is there a problem, Jim? Are you in trouble? You seem unsure of yourself. And your voice is a little hoarse. I am unsure of myself. And my voice probably sounds hoarse because of all the dust I ate overseas. Is that window soundproof? Yeah, pretty much. You can talk. Well, there does seem to be a slight problem. But it's difficult... difficult to... You, look, you don't have to talk about it now. Whenever you're ready... No, it's not that. I mean, it's difficult to explain because I don't understand it myself. I'll make it short and simple, which is what my memory is now. Short and simple. Go on. You know you can trust me. Do I? What, what do you mean, Jim? Do I know you, is the question. Because it... Okay, here. I was on a job out of the country, in Colombia, in fact. I got grazed in the head by a bullet, which caused this, but it's healing, so no problem there. The thing is this, right now I have a personal life history of a day in Colombia and two nights in the hospital, meaning I lost my memory. I can't remember my past, I can't remember my job, I can't remember anything. <sighs> what about me? You do remember me, don't you? I want to remember you. Believe me, I'm trying hard right this instant to remember you, but I can't. I, that's the worst of it. I don't. That explains that word expression on your face. I've never seen that expression. What did the doctors tell you? Not much, except I should be fine in a few days, you know, once I get around familiar things. Good. Let's believe that the doctors know what they're talking about. We'll be home soon. We'll relax and I'll nurse you back to health. That sounds good. Just remember that I don't remember you at all, so I'm a little uncomfortable. <laughs> That's nice, actually. Kind of like a first date. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> what was our first date, by the way? Your condominium for three days. Oh, sorry. Well, I wasn't, and neither were you. Well, here it is. 
Welcome back. Wow. I live here? Sure. Does it look familiar? No, I'm sorry to say. It looks expensive. You can afford it. Am I renting or do I own it? You said you own it, so I guess you do. Sounds just fine, because I like it. What a view. Washington Monument, right there. Well, at least you remember something. Everybody knows the monuments. You're staring at me. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I? I didn't realize it. <laughs> yes, you were. But I rather liked it. You haven't looked at me like that for a long time. What long time? Mm, a month or so. Ah, uh, that is long. You make love to me all the time. But it's been that long since you really looked at me. Make love. Yeah. Uh, you know, knowing you but not knowing you has got me really feeling weird. I was hoping that you and the place would bring it all back to me. But I think it's going to take more than that. Some kind of image my mind remembers. You know... I just had a thought. I think I can give you that image. Images. Oh, really? Yeah. Just a minute. Let me get something. What is it? Put on some, <laughs> some of my other clothes? No, no, no. Better than that. Here, I got it. It's all right here inside this envelope. What is? Your past history. Well, actually, our history. How long have we been together? Four or five months. Okay, let's take a look. We took these photos on our trip to Florida two months ago. Huh. Oh. Uh, who took all of these? We did. And some strangers took some of us together. So how about it? Do you remember Florida? Only that it was discovered by Ponce de Leon when he was... Searching for the Fountain of Youth. A quest I wouldn't mind going on, by the way. Why's that? I woke up a few days ago for what felt like the first time, and I was already 56 years old. You never minded your age before. That's probably because I had a past behind me. Now I have nothing behind me but two days. Just doesn't seem fair, you know? Well, I'm about 15 years behind you. And I don't like my age any more than you. Well, you shouldn't mind it. You look about 30 to me. <laughs> Thank you. So, how about these photos? Do anything for you? <sighs> Only that I look a little different from what I see in the mirror. But of course. You were relaxed down there. You're all tensed up now. <sighs> yeah. You know, it gives me a weird feeling to see photos of myself at places I've been, but with no memory connected. I think you should just relax and forget all that for now. Are you hungry? No, I'm fine. You? No, but I didn't get much sleep waiting for you. How about a bath and a nap? You know, I hardly slept at all in the hospital. Might be a good idea. Good. I'll make a couple of phone calls and join you soon, okay? Okay. In the bedroom, McKnight's naked body was greeted by cool, white satin sheets, a far cry from the rough-textured cotton ones that the hospital had to offer. This was his last thought as sleep overtook him. The sound and motion of the bed covers woke McKnight, a hint of perfume, as well as the sound of silk sliding on satin, filled the air. Still sleepy. No, I'm away. Good. I was hoping you were. It's been over a week. I've missed you. If I could remember, I'm sure I would have missed you too. Well, let's not worry about that now. Let's just believe that after a few days, you'll be all right. We're here. And that's all that matters. Remember me later. Mm -hmm. 
McKnight became lost in the satin sheets and Carla's satin skin. The hypnotic sound of her breathing, moaning, and whispered endearments filled his ears. Was it after 30 minutes or an hour or two hours later when Carla cried out and went limp in his arms? He couldn't tell. She had moved him into a timeless state for that dreamlike period they were locked together. As he held her, he quickly followed her to sleep. With his conscious mind at bay, McKnight's subconscious brought him another dream. He found himself seated at a kitchen table in a home he didn't know. A woman put down a plate of eggs and bacon in front of him. It wasn't Carla, and it wasn't anyone he recognized. She looked to be about 50, and someone who had been at least cute looking in the past, but had obviously stopped caring about what she had looked like years ago. He was in the middle of a conversation with her, one that McKnight didn't know how to respond to. But dreams have a way of pushing you into the situation, and this dream was no exception. While you're eating, maybe you can explain why well, we're not going on vacation this year, as if it matters anymore. It's just that I have other plans that are important to my job. Job? I don't call that your job. I call that your problem. Do we have to go through this same old song and dance every time I sit down to eat? Song and dance is about all we have left. I mean, if we don't even take vacations anymore, then what's the use? I know. I know. Just see me through this time, and things will change, I promise. This is an important time for me. And what about me? When's my important time? As she talked, McKnight turned and looked at the kitchen door just as the three bandits from Colombia walked in, their wounds still bleeding. Hey, senor. Do you want us to help her shut the hell up? I mean, you must be sick of this shit, when no? I get something out of life? Yeah. Let's pull out our cannons and shoot this bitch. Si, sí, como no. Dishes, cleaning, what shopping, the hell? Cooking, and hey, uh, aren't you guys dead? Si, sí, jefe. Your friend in the helicopter killed us pretty good. I mean, I might as well get paid. But that was no fair. A rifle from out of the sky? Hijo. I thought God was killing us. Well, you had it coming, don't you think? I mean, so why don't you hombres turn around and... Get the hell out of here. Who are you talking to? You don't see these guys? You're the one that sing things. Now, hey, Jefe, tell her to shut the hell up or we will. That's about all Stay that's out of it. What? Stay out of what? Hijo, enough of this shit. I can't stand it. I don't know how you can. The three banditos pulled out their weapons, aimed them at the woman, and fired. The woman took all three bullets simultaneously, sending her across the kitchen, up onto the sink where she crashed into a pile of dishes, and then bounced to the floor dead. Santa Lucia! She really puts on a show! Sorry, but now it's your turn, Heffy. Wait a minute, whoa, wait a minute. You guys aren't real, you're dead. This is a dream, isn't it? For us it is. For you, it's a nightmare. The bandits turned their weapons on McKnight. Ah, oh, Jesus. The feel of satin, the smell of perfume, and the sound of Carla breathing next to his face told him that he had awakened, and none too soon at that. And now he had no intention of going back to sleep until he put some distance between himself and that nightmare. The clock on the nightstand read 2.17. Coffee, that's the ticket, he whispered to himself. He felt his way to the bedroom door, not bothering to search for his clothes, and headed down the hallway to the kitchen. There was just enough ambient light coming through the window for him to see. Not wanting to sting his eyes with a blast of strong light, he decided to brew his coffee in the relaxing atmosphere of the semi-darkness. But before beginning the task, his nude body felt a cool breeze suddenly hit him, as if a door or a window had just been opened. Perhaps Carla had gotten up. He looked into the living room and saw the curtain covering the sliding glass door that led to the terrace blowing, pushed by a breeze coming from the outside. He had just passed through the living room on the way to the kitchen and nothing had been moving, not the curtain, not anything. And he hadn't felt any kind of breeze at all. Then he saw it. 
the shiny black double barrel of a shotgun protruding under the curtain and slowly beginning to lift it as someone began to enter. McKnight's mind started racing. Am I dreaming? The answer came back, no. Is there any chance that this is a mistake and not a dangerous intruder? The answer came back, shotgun, balcony, 2 a.m.? No, not a mistake. A real intruder, a home invasion. He knew for sure that this was a life or death situation and not just his life, like it had been on that dirt road in Columbia. It was also Carla's life as well. He knew he had to kill or be killed. The intruder had a shotgun, no chance to subdue him. His only chance to survive was to kill him quickly before the shotgun could come into play. His best defense would be surprise, but that opportunity would be gone in seconds. Adrenaline pumped through his heart. I can do it, he convinced himself. I'm James McKnight. Time to put my CIA training to work, even though I can't remember it. But it has to come back to me in this situation. He grabbed the frying pan from the stove and a carving knife from its holder on the drain. He quickly moved into the living room, stalking his prey like a naked Neanderthal, Teflon-coated club in hand, ready to protect his mate's cave. Just as the enemy stuck his head under the curtain, McKnight swung his arm with all of his strength in an upward backhanded motion, catching the large man right under the nose with the edge of the frying pan, shattering the front of his face. The man dropped the shotgun as if it were on fire. McKnight followed through with the carving knife that struck dead center into the man's solar plexus. The man fell out onto the terrace, bumping into a second man. McKnight heard him groan as the first man hit him. McKnight dropped the frying pan and scooped up the dropped double-barreled shotgun. He inserted two fingers into the trigger guard as he held the gun at hip level and aimed at the shadow behind the blowing curtain. He pulled both triggers at once. McKnight, now holding the spent shotgun in both hands like a club, peered out onto the balcony. The second man had been sent flying back, wedging him between two struts of the terrace guard railing. The white curtain had stuck to the man's body and was turning red. Carla crept down the hall, too terrified to think about clothing. She reached the living room and turned on the light. What she saw made her stomach sick. But then a warm feeling started building just below there and began to move down to her thighs. She basked in the raw power of seeing her naked lover sprayed with blood and standing victoriously over his slaughtered enemies, club in hand. McKnight sensed what was happening to her and let the primal energy well up in him. These are the times, times of terror and all-out victory that brings the flood of memory flowing back into amnesia victims' minds. McKnight could feel that this might be the moment for him. As he waited for the memory of his life to come back to him, he took a deep breath and looked at his vanquished would-be assassins. He then turned his gaze over to his naked mate that he had so valiantly protected, and now for the first time since he had awakened in Columbia, he felt alive, really alive. But his past was still a blank and his mate's face, that was now perspiring with violent eroticism, was still a mystery. Bishop and Lidecker arrived 45 minutes after McKnight called them. A shotgun with a backup man. Professional, a very professional hit. Professional attempt, you mean? Looks like you turned your apartment into your own personal slaughterhouse, McKnight. Well, Agent Lidecker, as you told me on the jet, I did what was necessary. You sure as hell did. Wow, what did you do to that one? I mean, we're gonna have to pry him out of the railing with a crowbar. Shotgun blast, I guess. <laughs> you guess? This other one's got a broken nose. I hit him with that frying pan before I stabbed him. Stabbed him? Frying pan? Where the hell's your piece? If you're talking about my pistol, I guess it's still back in Columbia, lying in the road. You've got a backup piece, don't you? I... I don't know. He's got a pistol in the dresser. Oh, good. Uh, could you please get it for us? Sure. Better for him if you had to use the pistol instead of a frying pan. A bullet hurts a lot less. Who in hell are these guys, anyway? Why break in like that? If I hadn't been awake, I'd be dead now. Probably Carla, too. Yeah, her, too. 
They look to be and probably will turn out to be freelance hitmen hired by the Massonetti crime organization. Now, d does that name ring a bell with you? No. No bell. Nothing rings bells for me. Should I know the name? I'll say you should. They've been after you for the last six months or so. There's a contract out on you because of all the heat you and the agency have been putting on them for the last couple of years. When you couldn't connect Massonetti himself with the several murders he ordered, you crossed the line into DEA territory and tried to get him for drug trafficking. That was part of the reason you were in Colombia. And to make matters worse, you were able to get Massonetti's son convicted of selling drugs. The kid's in prison now, so I guess Mazzanetti figures it's payback time. Here's the pistol. It's already loaded. Thanks. Here you go, Jimbo. You'd better keep this with you. Why? I seem to be doing all right with kitchen utensils. You'll save the next guys a lot of pain if you just shoot them. You think there's gonna be more guys? Probably not. But you know the saying about better have a gun and not need it than to need a gun and not have it? I don't know the saying, but I've found that it's true. Okay, next order of business is to get the two of you out of here and into a hotel for safety. I was thinking the same thing. Lidecker, could you drive the two of them to some out-of-the-way hotel? I guess I could handle that. Well, uh, I think I'd like to do that myself, just to be sure that no one knows where we are, and I mean nobody. You can trust me, McKnight. We're on the same team, or haven't you noticed? I know that, but I'd feel better this way. Which way do you want it, Bishop? Yeah, okay. Um, sure, you and Carla can take off by yourself and get something without a balcony. I'm way ahead of you. Okay, good enough. But call me after you checked in. Uh, and don't use a credit card, use cash and another name. Don't worry. I'm starting to get the hang of this. I bet you are, Jimbo. I just bet you are. McKnight and Carla checked into a Sheraton hotel. Carla slept, but McKnight couldn't. He had phoned Bishop when they checked in. Bishop had assured him that he would start solving problems. Problems too many for Bishop to explain to him at that time. But he promised to call back in the morning for a status report. At 8 a.m., the phone rang. Hello, George Custer here. Hey, Jimbo. You figure I'm making a last stand at the little big Sheraton? You know your history. How are the two of you managing? Television, room service, and sleep. You've got me leading a first-class life. Look, Jim, we've identified the two hitters that paid you a visit last night, definitely from the Mazzanetti organization. You think they'll send more? Well, maybe, but for right now, you'll be safe right where you are. Well, I can't stay in this hotel prison all my life. You won't have to. We're working on something. And that would be? We're working on talking a possible deal with Mazzanetti. Maybe negotiating a truce. And how are you planning to manage that one? Well, it won't be easy, but, well, we can offer him some money, immunity for past crimes, something like that. And also, he'll do anything to get his son released from prison. The CIA would do that for me. Well, since you are CIA, it's possible. We'll have to call in a few favors, but you've got friends upstairs, Jim. Even after the bungled mission in Columbia? Hey, don't worry about that. I think the director will go easy on you. Just answer his questions truthfully. You'll do all right. What if I don't remember the answers? Oh, yeah. How's that going? I can't remember a blessed thing. And I don't think I ever will. I can't even remember Carla. And how's that going? Well, uh, um, she's sticking with me, and I'm trying to adjust to her as a stranger. Well, just enjoy the adjustment, pal. Hang in there a while longer, and we'll talk as soon as we can make some progress. Right. Thanks. Sure, take care. What did he have to say? He's working on some sort of plan to get Massanetti to call off his dogs. Good. Maybe you can get him to replace the balcony door before we return. That's a good idea. You didn't get enough sleep, Jim. Neither did I, for that matter. Come back to bed. Yeah, maybe I can sleep. How are you?
you feeling? The same. Still can't remember anything? Oh, regular stuff, but no personal stuff. Well, how about me? Some kind of distant memory, but all in all, you're still a stranger. And, um, and are you enjoying sleeping with a stranger? It's heaven. Makes all this other craziness almost worthwhile. Almost worthwhile? Move closer. Now, hold me. Now try to make it all worthwhile. I didn't mean that you weren't worth this. You are. Show me. McKnight and Carla slept until noon. Then they ordered room service. Now McKnight was pacing the floor like the hunted animal he was. I think the hotel is going to charge us for the rut you're wearing in the carpet. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Good news, I hope. Custer? Yeah, it's Bishop. You okay? Sure, everything's fine. Got some sleep. What's up? We contacted Massanetti. He's been living in a suite at Caesar's Palace in Atlantic City for the last few weeks. It's his alibi while this contract's out on you. But anyway, after talking with him, he called for a temporary ceasefire, as it were, until we can negotiate a truce. That sounds okay. Yes, it looks promising. Just hold on for another couple of days, and then I think we can bring you home. I'm looking forward to it. I'm getting a little stir-crazy. Cabin fever's got you after only one night. Yes, sir, it has. <laughs> even with your playmate there? Yes, even so. You know, there's a shopping mall just a few blocks from where you are. I guess it would be all right if you walked around there for a while. You know, go shopping, grab an orange Julius. It's called the Eastmont Mall. Well, that would be great. You think it's okay? It's safe? Sure, sure. No, no problem. Nobody knows where you are anyway. And Well, like I said, there's a ceasefire. And we're going to straighten out everything with Massanetti for sure. Are you going to release his son from prison? Well, I don't think it'll have to come to that, but it'll be something like a reduced sentence, special treatment, you know, make his cell look like the Holiday Inn or something. That should satisfy Massanetti, and his son will be home in a couple of years. <sighs> Sounds good. We might just go out and celebrate, Orange Julius and all. Good. Talk to you soon. Right. Well, it looks like things are moving forward. It sounded like good news. Yeah, Massanetti's called off the contract while they negotiated his son's early release. Day or two, we should be home free. What about the balcony door? <laughs> what? Are you serious? I am. When we get home, I don't want to be stepping over broken glass, blood, and chalk marks. I'll be sure to mention it in the very next phone call. What do you say? We walk around the mall. Go shopping. A celebration gift for you. <laughs> Better get a celebration gift for Bishop. I didn't do anything but keep you company. Best company I ever had. The feeling's mutual. So, let's hit it, shall we? <sighs> what? I think I'd like to stay here. I got a headache watching you pacing for the last hour. I am sorry. I'm not your fault, really. Anyway, I just want to take a long bubble bath and let it disappear. Do you want me to get you something for it, aspirin, no, Tylenol? No, 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 I'm not one for medicine. A bath should do the trick. It usually does. Okay. We'll just relax here. No, 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 it, it, it's, it's okay. You go take a walk, stretch your legs, go window shopping, maybe find a good book. I'll expect you back in a couple of hours. Well, if you think that's okay, maybe just an hour. Sure. Go relax, unwind. I'll be fine when you get back. Uh, I suppose I should take the pistol and shoulder holster. You think you should? I mean, if Bishop said it was safe, maybe guns and amnesia don't mix. Well... Have a gun and not need it is best, you know, so... Okay, maybe it's a good idea. Sure. I'll be back before you know it. Well, just make some noise when you come in so you don't startle me in the bathtub. What if I intend to startle you in the tub? <laughs> okay, okay, that'd be just fine. 
Can I pick anything up for you? Sure. You can bring me back a surprise. <laughs> sort of surprise. Well, if I knew, then it wouldn't be a surprise, would it? <laughs> Besides, little girls like it when the father brings a gift. Oh. Am I a father figure to you? Maybe. In part. Anyway, I do feel protected with you. I'm glad you feel that way. I like protecting you. Well, anyway, see you soon. Bye. The Eastmont Mall made McKnight feel as though he was finally home. He moved through the food court, weaving by people carrying trays of food and searching for tables. As he reached the less crowded area where the numerous shops began, he knew why this feeling of serenity had come over him. This was the first place that felt normal. The other places, the hospital, the streets of Washington, even his own condo had felt like an extension of the Colombian jungle, what with all the violence. However, this place was buzzing with normal human activity. Nothing is more human than eating and shopping, he thought. So with his tension now tranquilized, he set out with the enjoyable task of finding a surprise to bring back to his little girl, his little girl with the flawless sweet face and satin body that could melt so easily into him. While he pondered that phenomenon, Unknown to him, a large Italian man in his 50s wearing a dark suit was following him through the mall. His name was Mike Baglietto. He had been following McKnight since he saw him walk out of the lobby elevator at the Sheraton. Baglietto recognized McKnight from a series of photos shown to him the day before. He had been alerted that McKnight would soon be leaving his room at the Sheraton. So for Baglietto, this was a simple identity and destroy contract, or hit as he liked to call it. After all, it was the preferred word for a mafia gangster. And that's what he saw himself as. And that's what he was. And proud of it. Killing someone in a public place was not exactly Baglietto's style, but he had killed a man at a golf course, two at a restaurant, another in a movie theater. So this shopping mall, even though crowded, would only be a slight challenge for him. Baglietto began to close the distance between he and his prey as he saw McKnight stop in front of a jewelry store and start checking out the merchandise in the window. Twenty yards away from McKnight, Baglietto reached ever so slowly into his jacket and took hold of the handle of his pistol. But his opportunity suddenly passed because McKnight entered the shop. Baglietto kept his pace constant and walked past the shop window without looking inside. He found an empty space on the bench next to a water fountain and sat down, keeping his eye constantly on the jewelry shop entrance. With the fountain behind him flowing away, Baglietto amused himself by reminiscing about the other hits gone by until he saw McKnight come out of the shop. He followed McKnight back to the more crowded area of the food court as McKnight headed for an exit. The time was at hand. Baglietto pulled out his silenced pistol quickly, aimed and squeezed the trigger but too slowly. A young woman passed in front of McKnight. The bullet hit her in the shoulder, causing her to scream and fall. Someone yelled, he's got a gun. The crowd screamed and dropped their trays and ran in every direction. McKnight's natural reaction was to duck and cover as he had done with the bandits in Columbia. This was a lucky move as a second bullet whizzed over him, hitting a large window near the exit door, shattering it as people flew out of the mall. McKnight's second reaction was to crawl behind a pillar and pull out his own gun. His enemy was easy to determine, standing stationary in the mall holding a silenced pistol while everyone else was running away from the area. Baglietto had momentarily lost sight of his target, giving McKnight an opportunity to fire back. He aimed and fired, but the gangster remained standing. McKnight had missed. Baglietto aimed at the end of the pillar and waited for McKnight to stick his head out. The worst thing that can happen to a professional hitman is the unforeseeable, unexplainable accident, namely bad luck. In this case, bad luck came in the name of Ron Vickers. Vickers had been working security at the mall for only three months. He was a clean-cut looking young man of 28 who was on his lunch break, a mere 50 feet away from Baglietto's right. He dropped his pizza, spilled his milk, and drew his own 38 caliber revolver. 
Baglietto, who was concentrating solely on McKnight, didn't see this young punk in a security uniform draw down on him, bracing his pistol with both hands. Vickers was no hero. In fact, he was scared. He had no time to think, so he just reacted. He aimed at Baglietto's ear and fired. Vickers was a fair shot, but with the speed at which he fired, coupled with his hands shaking with fear, the shot went low, hitting Baglietto in the side. Vickers' bullets spun Baglietto around, making him face the pizza kid, as his co-workers were so fond of calling him. Before Baglietto could aim his pistol at his assailant, the kid squeezed off another shot aimed dead center at the hitman's chest. Baglietto had started ducking just as Vickers pulled the trigger, causing his head to collide with the bullet at the scalp line, having the effect of separating Baglietto's brain from its cranial cavity. Baglietto was dead before his 250 pounds crashed to the floor. This was Vickers' first shootout, and he knew that a dead man can surprise you, even a very dead man with no brain. So Vickers never took his eyes off Baglietto as he approached him. This gave McKnight the time to crawl, get to his feet, and then run out of the mall with the last of the panicking shoppers. In the hotel room, Carla was neatly packing her clothes in an overnight case when McKnight silently entered the room behind her. He picked up a table lamp and threw it at the wall. What? Jim, what, what's wrong? What happened? Going somewhere? No, I was just packing a few things. I thought you had a headache. I did. I mean, I do. I don't understand what's happening. Somebody just tried to kill me at the mall. Oh, my God. Are you all right? If it hadn't been for some... Security guard, I'd be dead now. I'm sorry. But it started me thinking about you. What? What about? I've been thinking that for the last two days you've been healthy. Extremely healthy, day and night. Then, when I decide to go out, suddenly you have a headache. So? So what? Nobody but you knew I was going to the mall. And Bishop... We're talking about you now. All right. Let's talk about me. Maybe you're part of what's been happening to me, all of which is bad. Maybe you're part of this Massonetti bunch. Maybe you made a phone call when I left for the mall. Did you set me up? Are you crazy? Just look at me. Do I look Italian to you? Don't give me that. They'll use anybody. Just answer me straight. Are you working for whoever's trying to get me killed? What a goddamn stupid question to ask a woman who's been climbing in and out of your bed for the last four months. You know, I think you're becoming paranoid as I hell. I might be paranoid, I'll give you that. But somebody wants me dead and somebody tipped off the killer. I was in the mall. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What's the gun for? What do you think, Carla? Well, don't point that thing at me, Jim. Now, you stop that. Talk or I pull the trigger. I told you everything. I told you the truth. I don't think so. Oh, put the gun down, Jim. So long, Carla. Oh. 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 I got to hand it to you, Carla. You fell right back on the bed where you do your best work. Come on, get up. What? Where? Where did you hit me? They're blanks, and you know it. Stop oh. playing dead. That's powder burns. You? God damn bastard. I'll kill you. I'll see you dead. I didn't do a thing. I didn't make any calls. You brought me my pistol from the bedroom drawer last night. You handed it to me after you put in the blanks. Stop talking. I've had enough. I missed three bandits in Columbia at close range, and now in the mall I missed again at close range. So I figured I'm either the worst shot in the CIA or I'm firing blanks. And you came back and tested it on me? No. I checked the gun in the elevator. Blanks. All five of them blanks. So that means you put them in there. It also means you're part of this. Why else were you packing? Because you didn't think I was coming back. I was packing because you said we were going home soon. Packing with a headache. Yes! Packing with a headache. You have an answer for everything. Yes, I have an answer to everything because I haven't done anything. I don't have anything to hide, no matter what you think. And, you know, you really are a bastard firing that gun at me. 
I thought I was dead. I thought I was too, two or three times recently. This, this amnesia thing, is it, is it really on the level? Not some CIA bullshit thing you and Bishop are doing. It's on the level. Yeah, I can understand what you're going through. And maybe even understand why you think I'm involved. But shooting a gun at me is the act of a crazy man. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm going a little bit nuts. But I didn't imagine that killer in the mall, and somebody told them I was there. The only ones that knew I'm here are you and Bishop. Well, maybe you should start considering Bishop. No, that's impossible. He's my friend. Hell, he's CIA. Why would the CIA send a mafia hitman after me? Do you know it was a mafia hitman for sure? Maybe. He could have been CIA, but he didn't look the type. And why would the CIA want me dead anyway? Well, you tell me. You seem to be on a roll, what with firing guns and all. Maybe I've become an embarrassment to him because of the screw-up in Colombia. A lot of men died there. The CIA wouldn't kill you in a mall like that. That's not their style from what I know of them. I think you're right. It must have been one of Massonetti's men. But how would Massonetti know I'd be in the mall or even at this hotel? That brings us back to your friend, Bishop. Yes, I could have put blanks in your gun, but so could Bishop when I was out of the apartment. I just got it out of the drawer and gave it to you. And you said you missed the bandits in Colombia? You could have had blanks then. I wasn't in Colombia, but Bishop was. Bishop. And he knew you were going to the mall. Bishop helping the mafia. Why? Well, all of this is so crazy that anything is now possible. Bishop helping the Mafia, the Mafia working for Bishop. Whatever it turns out to be, it has to be Bishop, not me. And like you said, Bishop knew you were going to the mall. He even suggested it. Well, there's the answer. It was Bishop, not me. No, I guess maybe so, not you. <sighs> now that we at last have that straight, come over here. What? That's for shooting at me and taking five years off my life, which I can't afford to lose. Okay. Okay. I hope that makes us even. No, it doesn't. Not by a damn sight. Now what? We had better stop talking about who's trying to kill you and talk about when the next attack will come. You're right. Let's get the hell out of here. Well, if you're not remembering, at least now you're thinking. Better change your blouse. We'll be less conspicuous without the powder burns. Well, you really are starting to think, aren't you? That'll be Bishop. You'd better answer it. If I answer it, he'll know I escaped the hitman and he'll try again. He probably knows already. Yeah, he probably does. And if you don't answer, he'll know you suspect him and have a team of hitmen here in ten minutes. Custer here. Just checking to see how you're doing. Something's, uh, happened. What, Jim? Uh, are you all right? I am, but just barely. How about Carla? She's here. She's fine. Uh, what exactly happened? Uh, I was in the mall just now, and what looked like another one of Massonetti's killers took a couple of shots at me and missed. Where is he now? The last I saw of him, he was lying dead in the mall. Did you kill him? No. Somebody else did. A uh, security man, I think. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that was one of my men, keeping an eye on you. One of your men? Oh. I thought it might have... Thanks. No need to say thanks. We're just doing our job. Speaking of which, the next thing to do is to move you and Carla to a safe house. Yeah. Right. Good idea. What do you want us to do? Just stay put for uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'll be right over with Lidecker to move you. Right. We'll be waiting. See you in 20. It's Bishop. It's him for sure. He's trying to get me killed and he's using the mafia to do it. 
Why? Let's think about that later. For now, let's just get the hell out of here. In his office, Bishop was putting on his jacket and preparing to head for McKnight's hotel. Agent Lidecker entered. What's going on? Oh, nothing much. Just for starters, Mazzanetti's man got shot in the mall before he could get the job done. How did that happen? Some punk security guard, if you can believe that. Two attempts and the clay pigeon is still walking around? Yeah, and now I, I think he's onto us. How do you figure? I, I got that funny feeling talking to him on the phone. Now get this. Here's a guy who was just attacked in the mall. A guy who was attacked last night in his condo. You think that even with amnesia, he should be pretty well pissed off by now. Yeah, I know I would be. Right. But when I tell him to stay put and we'd be right over, what does he do? Does he start yelling, making demands? No. He politely says, okay. I see what you mean. We'd better get over there. Yeah, let's go. But he won't be there. You know, we're going to need more agents for this. You and I just aren't enough. What about those agents that helped us in Colombia? We can call them in when we need them, but the boss wants to keep everything in Washington as low a profile as possible. If he and Carla left the hotel, we'll be in a search and destroy mode, and we'll need every one of those agents. Because, Bishop, it looks like this thing is starting to fall apart on you. On you, too, if we don't pull this off. Hey, I'm just caught up in this thing by being the partner of the wrong guy at the wrong time. That's all. Well, you are caught up in this thing. That's all you have to know to do your job. And don't give me any of that reluctant killer attitude. You wasted those bandits in Colombia without hesitation. It didn't look reluctant to me. Hey, they were scum, and they had it coming. Just for the record, yeah, I did it. But I didn't like it. And as hard as it is squeezing the trigger on a couple of strangers, it's even harder firing on someone you met close up. Well, don't worry about that, Lidecker. The mafia will do the trigger squeezing. You just help me set him up and then take your promotion and your bonus. Oh, and be sure to make some signs if it gets too sticky for you. I won't have to make any signs. I'll tell you directly if it comes to that. Just see that it doesn't. Do your job, like it or not. Are we going to talk or are we going to get on with this job of yours? Just get the door, will you? Thirty minutes later, Bishop and Lidecker entered McKnight's room with a passkey secured at the front desk by flashing their badges. Well, just like you thought. Long gone without checking out. Our man's on the run for sure. Yeah, and with the boss's girlfriend. Seems like. Jesus, let's get out of here. I can't wait to hear you tell him that his main squeeze is on the run with the pigeon. I'm going to delay that call as long as possible. Let, let, let's just hope we get lucky and find the two of them before we have to report in. And don't forget, he's your boss, too. Oh, you're my boss. You're my buffer. If things keep going bad. I'm not much of a buffer for you. If I fall, other dominoes fall right along with me. Don't you forget that. Yeah, that's the only reason I've stuck with this thing so far. Well, good. Now let's start the search and capture our pigeon. Our pigeon and Carla. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Carla. You know, in a way, I, I wish I was him. I've had a thing I, uh, for Carla for a long time. Hope the boss gets tired of her. Yeah. Rank has his privileges, even when it comes to women. Especially when it comes to women. And Carla knows how to play that game. She's the type that will always gravitate toward Rank. As cash would be a major issue for escape, McKnight and Carla went to a bank to get as much of it as possible. Carla sat in the waiting area as McKnight stepped up to a teller's window. Hello. Hi, how can I help you today? I'd like to get the maximum cash from all four of these credit cards. Do you have three pieces of ID? I remember when it used to be just one, which is about all I can remember. Pardon me, sir? No, nothing. I have three. Even more if you need it. Driver's license, weapon permit, and my CIA ID card. Oh, CIA. Yes, that's where I work. Just a moment, sir. I'm sure there'll be no problem. The teller checked her computer, ran around getting required signatures and authorizations from two bank officials, and then went into the vault with one of them. McKnight looked over at Carla, who had her eyes glued to him. 
Her face showed the gravity of the situation as she knew full well the exposure that the two of them were pulling, waiting around in a bank full of cameras, computers, and telephones should anyone become suspicious or alerted by Bishop. The teller came back and began counting out the money. That's a total of 85000 sir. Good, thank you. I was advised that the next time you need this amount, it's best to phone us in advance so we can have it ready for you. But seeing as how you have excellent credit in our CIA, we made an exception this time. Oh, I see. I will, and I appreciate that. Would you like to have an envelope, Mr. McKnight? No, thank you. I'll be fine. Don't forget your ID, sir. I'm still trying to remember my ID. Sir? Oh, just something we say in the office. I see. Yes, sir. Stuffing packs of cash into his pockets, McKnight walked over to where Carla was seated. He motioned to her to open her purse, and he pushed six packs into it. She quickly snapped her purse shut and stood up. The two of them walked out of the bank together. In an unmarked CIA vehicle, Lidecker was at the wheel as Bishop received a call from one of the Sidewinder operatives. Bishop here. He used his credit cards at a bank. Where's the location? Downtown, Main and Third Street. Well, they're long gone from the bank by now. Let us know if there's any more activity. Okay, we'll stay on it. Right. You used your credit card? Yes, bank downtown. Pulled out 85 grand in cash. We faxed the bank the photo of them, and they ID'd him and Carla. Well, that's not so good. A pigeon with cash is harder to track. They won't get out of town. I've got men at the airport and the train station. Mm, but not the roads. We don't have the manpower for that. Like I said, this operation's been understaffed since the beginning. It had to be that way. We'll just have to wait for them to slip up. And they will. After the bank, McKnight and Carla bought a used Ford Mustang for cash and headed out of the city. Carla opted to drive, which was fine with McKnight, as he needed the rest. They headed west on Highway 50 into Virginia and, more importantly, away from Washington, D.C. There was no destination mentioned between the two of them. Their only goal was distance, distance from Bishop, distance from the CIA, the Mafia, and anyone else that was looking for them. McKnight tilted his seat down and put his head back. This position afforded him a view of Carla's profile with the buildings, telephone poles, and trees flying past outside, a wonderful, though hypnotic view. His eyes became heavy, and she gave him a quick glance. How do you feel? Like Clyde Barrow, after robbing a bank. <laughs> that would make me Bonnie Parker. You know your history. Mm, I know my movies. And such a beautiful Bonnie Parker there never was. And such a scared Bonnie Parker there never was. Did you know that she actually wrote a poem and sent it into the newspaper and they printed it? No, I didn't know that. You're the one that knows his history. Hmm. How did the poem go? Oh, uh, well, I did read it, I think, uh, more than once. But I just remember the ending. So, let's hear it. Let's see, something like, someday they'll go down together. Hmm, sexy and they'll bury them side by side. To a few, it'll be a grief, to the law of relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, I'm sorry I asked. Yeah, sorry. Seems like your memory's coming back. I mean, if you can remember trivia stuff like that. Yeah, trivial stuff, historical stuff, but nothing about myself or you. Why don't you tell me about yourself? Sounds like we're on another first date. I've been on a first date with you since outside the hospital. And what a date it's been. Yep. Kisses and killings. Ah, oh, you do both of them so well. Mm -hmm. But the kisses have changed since you've been back from Colombia. I like it. Falling asleep? In the 21 years Bishop had worked for CIA, he had never been in such a bad situation. He knew that until his pigeon used his credit cards again or was spotted at a train, a bus, or an airline terminal, he was just going through the motions of finding him. And time was running out. 
He usually made his daily status report about Operation Sidewinder to his superior at four in the afternoon. It was nearly five as he stood over the computer while a rail-thin female operator punched the keyboard at his request. He hasn't used his credit card since the bank, sir. He probably used up most of his credit on all the cards and doesn't intend to use them again. He knows what he's doing. Looks that way. Stay on top of it. Right, sir. Bishop here. What's the status on the project? Well, uh, we've run into a bit of a snag. What kind of snag? Massonetti's man missed him at the mall. In fact, he was killed by a mall cop. Our pigeon got away. Son of a bitch. Where is he now? We're not exactly sure. We're, we're waiting for him to make a slip-up. Get, get spotted someplace where we've got his photo faxed, airline terminals and so on. Where's Carla? She's with him. We've got her photo faxed out as well. Jesus, Bishop. You know, you're really giving me a screwing if you don't get this working right. And Mazanetti is going to be pretty pissed off about losing his man. Well, something's going to break soon. I know it. And it better break fast. That drug is going to work out of his brain within the next 24 hours. I know. I, I, I know. We're, we're on it, sir. On it isn't good enough. Just get the job done. Well, he's a dead man even if I have to do it myself. The idea is to have Mazzanetti's men do it, shit for brains, not you. Oh, yes, yes, sir, of course. That, that's, that's what I meant. Shut up. Call me when anything breaks. Yes, sir, I will. McKnight had slept in the passenger seat of the Mustang for three hours. While heading into the Appalachian Mountains, he slowly awoke. It was black outside, so Carla's face was illuminated only by the green dashboard lights, giving her a ghostly look as if she were some beautiful spirit taking him to the land of the dead. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> Looks more like nice to me. Where are we? Uh, about two hours away from Charleston. I guess I should ask how far away from Washington are we? Exactly 273 miles from Abe Lincoln's statue. It's hard to see outside. Looks like we're in the mountains. Appalachians and still climbing. Um, what's the plan? I forget. We never discussed a plan beyond getting away from Washington, which we've done. Well, you think we made a clean getaway? I think so. Except for the used car salesman. If he's questioned by chance, <laughs> He'll probably remember us, all right, what with us being in a hurry and paying in cash and all. Well, he'll remember you for sure. <laughs> Which is more than we can say for your memory, right? Right, I'm afraid so. Which brings us to an important subject. I'm all ears. Of course, I appreciate you being here, in fact. Love you being with me, but... Look, this is too dangerous you being with me. We should consider splitting up until this thing is resolved, or... Uh... Or until you're dead? Well, it is possible that this thing could finish off badly for me. But if something should happen to you... I know, I... I know. You'll never forgive yourself. No. Look, I appreciate your candor, but I've already survived two killers breaking into our place. And I got us out of the hotel and Washington. So I think I can handle myself. That you can. Anyway, if I get into trouble, you can always defend me with your frying pan. Or my pistol full of blanks. I don't know if you're shooting blanks or not. But I've certainly come to admire your pistol. Same old pistol. Ah, but you're using it a lot different these days. That's just because I can't remember my normal way of using it. That's right. I keep forgetting that. To you, this is just a three-day affair and not a four-month relationship, isn't it? That's right. Why don't you fill me in? Fill you in? About us, I mean. Where do I start? From the beginning. I... Tell me how we met. Well, I already told you some of it. But about six months ago, I was a translator at CIA headquarters, and, well, 
I guess you saw me when you passed my office. And one day you came in to talk to me. You know, just normal chit-chat. And you introduced yourself. After that, you stopped by almost every day and then asked me to lunch. And there were dinners at fancy restaurants. And once a large party that the president and first lady attended. That was the night you asked me to see the view from your condominium. <laughs> Not very original tactics, but it got me there. That night, I didn't go home. It was a Saturday night and I stayed over and made breakfast for us. That became a weekend habit and before long you asked me to quit my job and move in with you. That was three months or so ago. Any of that story ring a bell? No, none of it, I'm sorry. I think this little adventure of ours has brought us closer together. In fact, I know it has. I guess you're right. Surviving a life-threatening experience is probably stronger than sex. Almost. I see some lights coming up. Yeah, maybe a hotel or restaurant on the mountainside. If it looks good when we get closer, let's check it out. Maybe get some coffee at least. Coffee. Oh, what a wonderful word. A few miles later, the runaway couple took an off-ramp onto a side road which led another three miles up the mountain to a bluff overlooking a large tree-filled valley. The hotel was built to give a log cabin feel to it, even though the logs were made of cement. Off to the right side of the hotel were about a dozen private cabins. Upon pulling up to the lobby entrance, Carla mentioned she would prefer that they stay in one of them. She saw a pool just below them that seemed to be heated, judging from the steam rising off it as the warm water met the crisp mountain air. She indicated that she might feel like a swim before sleeping. McKnight was able to secure one of the cabins without using his credit card, and then he and Carla went directly into the restaurant. It was nearly 11 when they made their way up the path to their cabin. Well, it's not bad. Looks like the kind of place Holiday Inn would have built for Davy Crockett. Should suit us well for tonight. <laughs> Any place with a bed will suit me tonight, and I mean for sleeping. Sleep all you want. Mm, but I think first a swim to relax me. Now? Well, not so much a swim, but a float. If memory serves, and it usually doesn't, we left the hotel in such a hurry that we didn't pack much, and one of the many things we didn't pack was swimming suits. It's late, and there doesn't seem to be anyone in the pool right now. You mean swim in the nude? I never had a problem with nudity. Beautiful women never do, I imagine. Imagine all you want, but let's get down there, and you can see the real thing. You make nude swimming sound very inviting. Isn't that what I'm doing, inviting you? Okay, let's give it a try. Good. Oh, um, in all this excitement, I forgot that I have something for you. What? Got it right here in my pocket. Something you can wear so that you won't be completely nude in the pool. What's this? When did you get it? I bought it at the mall just before the hitman tried to do me in. If he would have succeeded, I wonder if this would ever have gotten to you. Open it up. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's not expensive. It's amethyst and a couple of small diamonds. I, I didn't know your ring size, but the sales girl helped me guess it. Oh, it, it, it fits perfectly. What made you? I mean, you've never done anything like this before. A surprise gift, I mean. I just wanted to give you something nice but not gaudy, something with style, beauty, and class, something like what you are. You never talked like this to me before. I don't remember what I've said to you or not. I want you to know that I'm happy you're here with me. Oh. With the kiss that followed, Carla seemed to be saying, we live and die together. And now all of the fear left McKnight. And all of the confusion of the past three days with McKnight left Carla. But neither of them had any way of knowing that within the hour, in the hotel swimming pool, James McKnight would die. 
With steam from the warm pool rising all around her, Carla shrugged off the last of her clothes with only McKnight there to see her. Her body caught the reflected light from the hotel that bounced off the water and danced around her velvet curves. McKnight sat on the edge of a lounge chair taking off his shoes, watching Carla. The pool itself was dug into the edge of a cliff overlooking a vast mountain range of pine trees which were now lit by the half moon. Carla slowly turned and descended into the glass smooth water, sending ripples away from her legs, hips, and waist. She turned around taking in all of the darkness, looking for signs of civilization, but there were none except for a trail of automobile headlights that were winding their way up the mountain highway miles away. Carla descended deeper into the water, enjoying the warmth. McKnight didn't mind the chilly air as he got out of the rest of his clothes because it made the steamy pool all the more attractive. And with Carla's beauty in the middle of it, well, he couldn't remember anything he'd ever seen that was so inviting. What's taking you so long? I was just watching you, that's all. It's like Eden, isn't it? Come on, get out of the cold air and into the water. This is wonderful. There's no one in the world but us. So good to just stop thinking for a while, turn it all off. Yes. You know, all the time I was driving, I feel like we were the dogs with a dog catcher after us. <sighs> time to forget about all this until tomorrow. Until tomorrow. It's nice to be together. Adam and Eve never had it so good. Hmm. Much better couple to relate to than Bonnie and Clyde. Yep. Oh, my God. What? Over there. Someone's coming. I see him. You look Italian, do you? What? Maybe. My gun's in my jacket on the lounge chair. It's only got blanks in it. It's better than nothing. Maybe I can run a bluff. Good evening. Hello. How's the water? <laughs> it's good. Yeah. It uh, looks nice. First time here? Um, listen, do you mind? I'm sorry. I, my wife's without a swimsuit, and she's kind of shy. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Didn't notice. Have a nice swim. Yeah, right. Thank you. Who was he? Nobody. I just overreacted. Well, then come on back and let's continue with whatever. McKnight watched the man continue on his walk and then turned back to look at Carla. She beckoned him with a wave and a smile, and he started moving back toward her when, suddenly, something hit his mind like a thunderbolt. He stopped in the middle of the pool, chest deep in the water. Something was happening. Was there another person coming, another possible attacker? He spun around, scanning the area, but no, there was no one. What's wrong, Jim? What's happening? Then it hit him again. It was like a flash of light inside his brain. Suddenly, he knew what was happening. He was remembering. Not all at once, but just a fragment of one incident, an image. Where was he? It was a lecture room, yes. In fact, the same lecture room that he had seen in one of his dreams. The lecture room was in a college, and the seats this time were filled with students. McKnight could see himself standing in front of the students. Carla was now by his side in the water. Her voice called to him like an echo coming back from a well. Are you all right? Jim, what's the matter? Tell me. Something in my head. Don't talk, just hold my hand. <sighs> McKnight could feel Carla take his hand, but concentrated only on what the electrons flying through his brain at that moment were showing him. Another image popped into his mind, and with it, another memory. He was standing in the middle of a room with a middle-aged, blonde woman. The woman who had been shot by the bandits in his dream. You know, I can't take any more of this. Any more of what? What are you talking about? The way our life is going. The way my life is going. It's just routine. All routine, with no surprises. That's what I can't take. The problem is that you have no interests, none at all. <laughs> I should have interests like you. Well, not like me, but something. Something to pass the time of day, like watching TV or, or take up a hobby. 
You make hobbies sound like something boring. If you find the right hobby, you can put some passion into it. Like you do? Well, yes. I'm very interested in my job, but it's more than a job. It's exciting. You call what you do exciting? Yes, I do. I don't do it just for the money. It's my chosen field. You're going to tell me that it was your lifetime dream? Well, no. I, I just fell into it. But yes, it's what I like to do best. Well, you know, I was thinking that you should start doing it alone. Alone? What do you mean? I mean without me. You don't need me. Even most of your meals are out of the house except for breakfast. And I could teach you how to cook bacon and eggs in a few minutes, and I could be free of all this. I don't think that I'm your problem. Well, then, what is my problem? I don't know. There was another flash of light, and McKnight was now transported someplace else. He knew that he was still in the pool with Carla, but he was also at this other place. McKnight could now see trees, newly mown lawns and school buildings. Students were walking to classes and talking to each other on a warm spring day. In the middle of this, McKnight saw himself standing under a large oak tree. Standing in front of him was a man with the administration building behind him. He looked to be around 50 with an executive haircut. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Larry. Tell me what, Conrad? Well, <laughs> It's, it's really hard to say, but this semester will have to be your last. What? Well, I wanted to tell you in person, like a friend, before you receive What do you mean? Well, I have tenure. I'm years before retirement. That's the rule. Yeah, I know all about that, but you yeah, see... What's the problem? My proficiency reports, my attendance record's been excellent. <laughs> you don't have to sell me. I think you're the best teacher I've ever seen. The students love your history classes, and... I've sat in a lot of your lectures. You not only know American history, you teach it as if you'd actually been to those historical events. You, you, very exciting. But we just don't have the enrollment we used to. Oh, bullshit, Conrad. We have to cut down on expenses. What are you talking about? You hired 10 new teachers this semester alone. Business teachers, computer teachers, foreign language teachers. <laughs> The history department's been overloaded as it and is. And why was I chosen to be let go? Well, most of the others have tenure like you, but all of the others are... Are what? Younger? McKnight slapped the water of the pool, remembering the pain and anger of that day. He let go of Carla's hand and moved through the water to the edge of the pool. Just as he was about to get out of the water, another memory hit him. Carla followed and put her arms around him gently as he let the memory move through his mind. The image that came to him now was a small office at the college. His office, was it? He was sitting with the blinds pulled shut and the door locked. He remembered that it was a week or so after he got the news of being fired and a few days after buying black powder for his replica dueling pistol a working replica that could fire a small metal ball once the pistol was prepared with flint and powder. Andrew Jackson had fought and won duels with this type of weapon, but McKnight wasn't planning on using it to win. He was planning on using it to stop losing. With the loss of his job, the loss of his faculty friends would come next. With the loss of his monthly income would come the loss of his trips to historical sites. Next to lecturing in his classroom, that was the thing he loved to do the most. And now that, too, would be lost to him. At his age, the next thing to go would be his health, a loss from which there would be no return. He couldn't see himself waiting for that, which was the reason McKnight could now remember, putting his mouth over the Andrew Jackson pistol and cocking back the hammer. He started to slowly tighten his finger on the trigger. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Ah, oh, Jesus. Hello, Professor Anderson? Can I talk with you a minute? Now what? He loosened his finger on the trigger and removed the pistol from his mouth. Are you in there, Professor? Just give me a minute. He stashed the gun in his desk, adjusted his tie, and got up to open the door. 
In the swimming pool, McKnight moved out of Carla's arms and pulled himself up out of the water. He moved naked over to the railing of the cliff that overlooked the mountains. Carla followed and moved next to him and put her arms around his waist. What did that student call me? Who are you talking about, Jim? A student called me by a different name. My right name. Carla didn't get an answer because he was remembering driving his car down a country road. Where was this, he thought. Oh, yes, there was an eight-mile stretch of two-lane road that wound through the hills on his way home from the college. This was the afternoon after his interrupted attempt to fire the Andrew Jackson pistol through the roof of his head. That having failed, he now decided to use Henry Ford's invention as his new tool of self-destruction. He remembered saying to himself out loud, let's do this right, and stepped on the accelerator while scanning the road ahead looking for a convenient tree to do the job on him. Who's the one screwing up my suicide plans, McKnight thought. God? He shook his head and eased up on the gas pedal. First, that student had come knocking on his door at the moment of truth, and now there were two cars pulled forward into the road blocking both lanes. McKnight slammed on the brakes, but it was a bit too hard, making his car skid and slide toward the automobile barrier. He gripped the wheel tight, turning it to adjust for the skid. In his search for a deadly tree, McKnight failed to realize that the automobiles in the road would have done the job on him as well, sending him flying through the windshield. Why then had he hit his brakes? Was it only an automatic survival reaction, or was he bailing out of the second time suicide attempt? He skidded sideways into the cars, passenger side first. His speed was almost down to 10 miles an hour by the time the impact occurred, so injury was improbable, even though he did slide across the seat and hit the opposite door of his car. It took him a few seconds to reorient himself, and in that short amount of time, a flood of business-suited men poured into the open door on the driver's side and grabbed him. He was savagely yanked out of his car and held with his arms pinned back by two of the largest men, while the others, six in number, went about what looked to be a very exact plan. McKnight put up a token struggle which he knew was to no avail. What the hell are you doing, he demanded loudly. He was rewarded quickly for his inquiry with an elbow to his solar plexus that bent him over. McKnight's wallet was pulled out of his pocket by one of the men holding him. He flipped it open and gave the contents a quick look. It's him, he confirmed. McKnight, still breathless, could only observe the rushing about of men, one of whom was backing up his car and aligning it with the road in the direction that he had been driving. Behind him, McKnight could hear the approach of another vehicle. An ambulance approached and came to a stop with three more men getting out of it. One of the men was carrying a hypodermic needle. He approached McKnight and crudely jammed the needle into McKnight's forearm. In less than a minute, it took effect. Standing in the cold mountain air with Carla, what McKnight remembered next was a blurred slow motion dream. He turned around to face Carla. What are you remembering, Jim? Everything. I was stopped on a road, drugged, stripped, clothes and watch. They were put on a dead body that was there in an ambulance. I don't understand anything you're saying. A body was put into my car, set on fire and pushed over an embankment. The gas tank blew. I remember the whole car in flames. They put me on a stretcher and I fell asleep. Who? Who did these things Had to Had to you? be the CIA. Oh, Jesus. What is it? I remember something else. What? Wait. I see it. I see it. McKnight remembered the long flight. Must have been to Columbia. He was strapped to his seat and spent the entire time in a drug-induced drowsiness. Then the jeep ride through the jungle. Ah, oh, yes. It was the Colombian jungle. And his next memory was the village. That damned village. He remembered the echoing voices as if he were hearing them from the bottom of a deep well. Hey, Doc, what's for keeping you? I had to mix this up specially. This isn't an ordinary injection. You sure this concoction of yours is going to work? 
It's worked on 80% of everybody we had tried it on in the past two years. And he really won't remember who he is? Yeah, psychogenic amnesia. He'll remember things, but he won't remember his past. Okay, hold his arm for me. Uh. Yeah. There, so now, uh, give him a few minutes, then I'll give him another injection to knock him out completely. Hey, Doc, we don't need him asleep. Everybody's standing by with this drug raid show. Relax, Lidecker. I'll give him a shot of speed to wake him up once we give him the head wound. And you're gonna take care of the head wound too, right? Yeah, don't worry about it. I've got a half-load blank in my pistol. I'll give him a cut in the head, powder burns and a headache. Just don't kill him. Stop with the orders, will you? The CIA didn't hire me for my good looks. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, I think he's ready. This will put him to sleep. You can start your show in about 10 minutes. That's when I give him a shot of speed. Standing next to Carla, McKnight now remembered how the voices disappeared as he fell asleep on the ground of that Colombian village. His next memory was of Lidecker's voice waking him up, the sound of gunfire, and his head hurting like hell. Near the hotel swimming pool in the Appalachians, McKnight turned to face the dark mountains in the distance. Carla moved around in front of him to study his face. I'm not sure I understand this. Tell me everything about what you remember. The CIA. They're a bunch of power freaks. They think they can get away with anything, everything. You worked for them for 20 years, and you're just now figuring that out? I've never worked for the CIA. What? I'm a college professor, a fired college professor. My God, are you going crazy, Jim? No, I am not going crazy. I finally got my mind back. I am not James McKnight. My name is Lawrence Anderson. James McKnight was now dead, or at least Lawrence Anderson's version of him. Anderson, like Adam, who had just eaten from the Tree of Knowledge, suddenly realized he was naked. He turned to Carla and motioned for his towel on the lounge chair. She grabbed it and wrapped it around his waist. He felt whole again as Lawrence Anderson, history professor, much more than he had as James McKnight of the Central Intelligence Agency. But his feelings for Carla hadn't changed. In fact, they were stronger. Stronger because he knew he was at the point of losing her. If she was part of the CIA conspiracy, then her job would be over now that he knew who he was. And if she was not part of it, she would be the real McKnight's woman, if there were a real McKnight. Anyway, how could this wonderful dream woman be attracted to a 56-year-old college professor? A 56-year-old CIA super spy? Well, yes. But a teacher that lived his whole life on the campus of an undistinguished college? No way. Carla was the first to break the silence. This is strange, Jim. I mean, I feel strange. I don't know what you're talking about. Is this some CIA exercise, some war game or something? Let's go back to the cabin. We'll talk there. All right. In the cabin, Carla sat on the edge of the bed as Anderson paced the floor in front of her. Look, uh, what I'm going to tell you is going to sound ridiculous and unbelievable, but I want you to know all of it before you say anything, and especially before you decide anything, because I think your life is in real danger, not just mine. My life's been in danger ever since she came back from Colombia. I know, but I mean in a different way. Please listen. I'll listen. I promise to listen to everything. Anderson proceeded to explain to Carla how, in fact, he was not James McKnight of the CIA, but a college professor from Indiana, purposely leaving out the fact that he was married. He explained the kidnapping, what he thought had happened in Colombia, and the fact that he didn't know Bishop or any other CIA agent. And more importantly, the fact that he had only met her for the first time after his release from the hospital. Finally, he ended his explanation and sat down on the sofa, signaling Carla that he was through talking. Her eyes darted around the room as if she was searching for an escape hatch in a flooding submarine. 
She then got control of herself. Nothing of what you just told me makes any sense. Your mind must be playing tricks on you because of the amnesia. If only they were true. Look, I've been with you for nearly four months. I've gone to dinner parties with you, seen many people talking with you, and addressing you as Jim McKnight. Not, not as someone else. I've seen you working at CIA headquarters, and they wouldn't give a security clearance badge to an imposter. So it's impossible that you're a history teacher. I am a history teacher. <sighs> I think we better stop talking for the night. Wait a minute. What's, what's the date today? It's uh, May, May 7th or 8th. I was at college, March 23rd. I have a special reason to remember that day, and on the way home, I was kidnapped. That was about six weeks ago, so I couldn't have known you for three months. So, what are you suggesting? Just for the sake of argument, let's say, you've been living with someone who looks like me, right? Well, yes, for the sake of argument. Whose name is McKnight and works for the CIA, right? Huh? Well, it seems that I've been put in his place four days ago, since that village in Colombia. No, wait, 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 wait. A college teacher lookalike takes the place of a CIA department head? For what reason? I don't know. You tell me. Well, how should I know? Not that I follow or even believe what you're saying. Are you saying you're not part of this? That you couldn't tell the difference between the real McKnight and me? Of course there was a difference. A big difference. But I thought that was because of your amnesia and the head wound you got in Colombia. And your voice was a little different. But it could have been a cold or something. I didn't have a cold, but I did have amnesia. And I am not McKnight. If you're not, then where is he? And why is the CIA doing this to you? I don't have the answer to that, but I think you're starting to believe me. Look, uh, take a good look at my face. Come over here to the light. Uh, this mirror. If you insist. My God, look. Tiny scars here and here. Are those plastic surgery scars? I can't tell. I've never looked at my face closely. What do you think? No, I, no, I do see a little difference. And yes, maybe those could be new surgery scars. Those bastards. Screwing up my mind wasn't enough. They had to change my face. I'm starting to get scared. Scared that you're telling the truth or playing some sort of game with me. Think, Carla. You haven't noticed other differences between me and a man you live with for months? Well, you were about the same except for what I just told you. I was the same in bed? No. <sighs> different. Very different. But I thought that was because of the amnesia. Wait a minute. I've got an idea. Now what? What are you writing? I want you to make a phone call. I'm writing down what I want you to say. Who do you want me to call? My wife. Your wife? You never said anything about a wife. The telephone ringing at such a late hour didn't bother Mrs. Anderson because she was wide awake. In fact, she loved any interruption in her nightly routine, which had become even more mundane than when her husband was alive. Six weeks earlier, she had received a call from the local police telling her that her husband had been involved in a single-car fatality. She had been spared the experience of having to identify his body since it was burned beyond all recognition. And because it was his car, and according to the police, the dental charts matched, the identity of the body was unmistakable. Then there was the quickly arranged closed coffin funeral where cremation finished the job that the burning car had started. In all of this, Mrs. Anderson was not sad with her husband's passing, nor was she relieved that he was gone. She, in fact, felt nothing but a page in her life turning. I'm sorry for calling so late, but I was a student of Professor Lawrence Anderson some years ago, and I'm trying to locate him. Is this his home? Yes, it is. In the hotel room, Anderson had his ear near the phone as Carla talked to his widow. My name is Carol Johnson. May I speak with him? 
How well did you know my husband? I knew him just as a student. I majored in history and I'm teaching now and would like to invite him to speak at a seminar. Well, Miss Johnson, I'm sorry to inform you that Professor Anderson recently passed away. Oh, I'm very sorry. Was he ill? No. No, it was an automobile accident. It was very sudden. I'm sorry. He was a great teacher. Well, I don't know. Yes, he loved his work. That was his life. I'm sure he would have gone to your seminar. In fact, the only time he left town was for seminars or field trips. Did he have any completed books or research? No, no, no books published. I don't know about papers. Maybe the college has something. But I cleaned out his study at home and threw everything out. Why don't you check with the college? Is there anything else, Miss Johnson? No, that's all I guess. Except to offer my condolences. Well, yes. Thank you. One of my friends joked about Larry the other day. He said Larry was in love with history. Now he is history. <laughs> well, thank you for your time, Mrs. Anderson. I'm sorry that we won't have Mr. Anderson at our seminar. Mm, life goes on, I guess. <laughs> For some of us, anyway. Yes. Good night. Goodbye. All my papers thrown out. Now I am history. Hasn't even been two months since I died. My own wife makes jokes about me. Not much of a eulogy, was it? You don't need a eulogy. You're alive. For how long, I wonder? I don't know the answer to that one. But you have three choices. Run, fight, or give up. And to me, giving up doesn't seem too productive. Well, now that I'm faced with those choices, I know the strategy used for every battle that was ever fought on American soil, and I play a damn good game of chess. Maybe with your help, we might stand a chance of winning. I'm sorry, but I can't continue on with you. I have to go back. Back? To him? McKnight, I mean. For all you know, he might be dead, which might explain why the CIA had me replace him. And if he's alive, why go back to him? He pays the bills. He's got the power. And I'm sure he's alive. He's too smart to be fooled by any conspiracy in his department. So that means... He's probably part of it. That's not the point. The point is, is it safe for you to go back to him? What do you mean? Well, it's kind of obvious. If you're not on their side, if you truly don't know anything about this, this conspiracy, then you've been used just the same way I've been used. If they let you believe that I was the real McKnight just to have this charade come off more realistically, then maybe you are now expendable. I mean, come on. The charade's over. The cat's out of the bag. You're no longer needed for whatever your purpose was. All the more reason for me to return to McKnight. That's the safest place to be next to the power. I'm sorry, but that's what I have to do. You'll have to decide on your own what to do. I know what a tragic situation this is for you, but this is what I have to do. There's no discussing it. Tragic situation, yeah, well... You know what I was doing before they kidnapped me? I was looking for a tree to drive my car into. And an hour before that, I was in my office with my mouth over a dueling pistol about to end it all. What stopped you? Fate. God. A student needing advice. Whatever it was, it stopped me from pulling the trigger and later... When I decided to run my car into a tree, the CIA stopped me. Why were you trying to kill yourself? <laughs> there was really no good reason. Now that I look back on it, I was having problems with my marriage and I was about to lose my job. Those are stupid reasons to kill yourself. Very stupid when I think about the fact that all I've been trying to do the last few days is... I'm doing my damnedest to stay alive. You could have saved yourself a lot of trouble by pulling that trigger. Are you suggesting that I kill myself now? 
I'm only saying that these last few days must have been hell for you. The best four days of my life. You know, even though I hadn't met you till a few days ago, I still get the feeling that I know you. Know you from somewhere. I just can't seem to put my finger on it. It's just your mind still playing tricks on you. What with the amnesia and all. I'm sure we never met. No, I guess not. And I would have remembered you for sure. You are so beautiful. Well, anyway, I'm sorry. But things have to be different now. Things are different now. They don't have to be. I know, but I choose them to be. You're risking a lot going back to him. I don't think so. Besides, I have no place else to go and no desire to start over again, especially if it means hiding out in some small town working at some small job. Do you know what I was doing before the CIA recruited me? I was a hostess in a restaurant in San Diego, a high-class restaurant, but I was just a hostess. Wait a minute. You said the CIA recruited you? How did they recruit you? Who recruited you? Was it McKnight or Bishop? Carla moved down to the head of the bed she'd been sitting on. She grabbed a pillow and held it in front of her while looking down at the floor, a definite signal that their conversation was over. Anderson knew that if he pursued his question, he would risk their fighting and perhaps her taking off with the car. And it was too late at night for that, and they were both too tired to travel. So there was no sense in doing anything stupid at this point. Carla, seeing the amethyst ring on her finger, unceremoniously took it off and placed it on the nightstand next to the bed. Anderson tried not to react to it, but let out a long breath of air. He had been a college professor, turned into a CIA agent with a beautiful woman by his side, but now the charade was over. No more high-status job, no more plush condo. Now only the danger remained, with no resources to fight it. Let's get some sleep. All right. We'll drive to Charleston in the morning. You can catch a plane back to Washington from there. Disc three. The sun came up from behind the Appalachians as Anderson and Carla headed for Charleston, West Virginia in the Mustang. Carla had insisted on driving and Anderson gave her no argument. She would fly back to Washington from Charleston. Anderson said he would keep the car and do whatever. Whatever because he wasn't sure what he would do or could do. He sneaked a glance at her as she drove. He couldn't imagine being in the car or another hotel room without her. Carla noticed his glance and decided that she might be behaving too strongly with the man she had just shared the last four days' adventures with. She decided to give a little before their separation. So how are you doing, feeling? All right, I guess. Happy to have my memory back, but not happy to be me. Without you? Well, that can't be helped. But if you still want to hear how I was recruited by the CIA, I'll tell you. Yes. Yes, it could help me put some of the pieces of this thing together. It might even help you to understand the position you're in. As I told you, I worked in a restaurant in San Diego about five or six months ago. A man started coming in to have dinner there. One night, he told me that he worked for the CIA in Langley. He asked if my Chinese was good enough to be a translator. He said the CIA job would pay four times what I was making at the restaurant, plus big benefits. So I thought I'd give it a try. Was the man McKnight or Bishop? No, it wasn't, just, just some recruiter. I never saw him after I was hired. That's the whole story, just simple like that. You do believe me, don't you? I have to. 
Not believing you would be too scary a proposition for me. Why is that? Because I... I... need you, I really do. I guess I'm obsessed with you. So if you're not on my side, it would be too much for me to handle. I'm on your side. For right now, that is. But I will fly back to Washington. Nothing will stop that. So stop obsessing with me. It's over. The fat lady didn't sing yet. Oh, she's singing all right. Just open your ears, listen and face it. At Charleston Airport, they parked the car in the short-term parking structure and took an elevator up to the ticketing area. Carla had warned Anderson to take off in the car, not park, but he wanted to see her off. Anderson waited while Carla booked a seat to Washington. The ticket saleswoman had a faxed photo of Carla and Anderson next to her computer keyboard. She easily recognized Carla, and when Carla walked over to where Anderson was standing, she recognized him, too. She picked up her telephone and punched the number that was on the bottom of the fax. With about an hour to wait for Carla's flight, Anderson suggested getting coffee at the cafeteria. She once again suggested that he should leave, but nevertheless, she ended up in a booth with him. After a few sips of her coffee, Carla opened her purse while checking to see if anyone was watching. She discreetly took out the six packs of cash that Anderson had given her in the bank. You had better take these. You should keep them for helping me. If you think about that for a second, you'll realize that I wasn't helping you. I thought I was helping Jim McKnight. And also, that's McKnight's money off of his credit cards. When I return, you'll probably give me the third degree about being with you. When he questions me about us taking those credit card cash advances, I don't want to have any of this cash in my purse. He's not going to be happy about you being with me, helping me. He'll know I'm telling you the truth when I say I really thought you were him. Besides, he'll have to answer for not telling me about switching places with you. Okay. In that case, I'll take this. That's a very expensive jacket you have there. Still worth about 75000 even after the car. I took the ring off the nightstand this morning. Here. I want you to keep it. Well, if he sees it? Just mix it up with the other jewelry. Uh, keep it to remember our time together. My, you are the romantic one. <laughs> I never was. I should get to my gate now. Right. Well, okay. Well, I guess this is it. Good luck. And don't stay around here too long. Get in the car and start driving as far from here as you can. And hide out in some small town. Sounds like good advice. Goodbye. Take care. Anderson watched her walking down the long corridor, hoping that she would look back and maybe wave. But she didn't, and soon she disappeared into the sea of passengers. How do you get rid of an addiction, he asked himself. An addiction to the ultimate woman. In the distance, he saw a possible answer. There was a green sign that read, Lounge. Remembering that he was a social drinker, Anderson thought that a double anything would definitely help fill his feeling of loss. In the runway view bar, Anderson held his double scotch and water. According to his calculations, it was time for Carla's plane to be taking off. Suddenly, his feelings caught up with his mind. He could feel his guts being torn away. She really was gone. Anderson gulped down his drink, leaned back, and relaxed into the over-soft booth seat. He had hardly slept at all last night, lying next to Carla, and now sleep was grabbing him by the eyes, and for the sake of emotional escape, he let the sleep and the alcohol have its way with him. His mind moved into darkness, and then a deep sleep, but his subconscious would have none of it, and sent a messenger to him. Hey, amigo, que pasa? Mind if I join you for a drink? 
What are you doing here? Didn't I shoot you? No, I don't think you shot any of us. It was that guy in the helicopter. Dios mío, y que dolió. As I remember it, you were on the ground with your hands covering your head. Well, what else was I supposed to do? You had me dead to rights. You could have stood and taken it like a man. What are you two friends? Oh, they don't need it. Besides, they were pretty worthless to me even when they were alive. I just came here to tell you not to run and hide. If you do, they will find you one day, and they will kill you. Are you sure about that? Men like that? They can't let you leave with the information you have on them. You know too much about these things. So if you run, you're dead. What other choice do I have? You can be a man. You like to brag that you know the battle strategy. Well, use that information to make a plan. You're good at chess. What do you think this thing is between you and these malo hombres but a chess game? So why don't you start playing? Better to die fighting than to die running. What do you say, amigo? What do you want me to do, take on the CIA and the Mafia? You don't have to take all of them on. Just fight against the men that are doing this to you. There's not too many, I think. Easy for you to say you're dead. You have nothing to lose. Hijo de puta, I'm wasting my time with you. Adios, Mr. College Professor. Too bad you can't be a man. Anderson woke up in the airport lounge. Looking at his watch, he realized that he had slept for only 30 minutes, but somehow he felt refreshed. He got a drink napkin from the counter, borrowed a pen from a sales girl, and sat back down ready to make a battle plan. In the center of the napkin, he wrote the word Carla and drew a heart around it. Next to the heart, he drew a dollar sign. He wrote down the name McKnight with the word CIA next to it. Then, Bishop. Next, he wrote the name Massinetti. Under that, the word son. He drew prison bars over that word. He thumped the pen on the napkin, repeatedly trying to make connections, find a weakness, a plan of attack, answers, anything. A half hour and one more drink later, Anderson came up with a plan which he labeled Anderson Takes McKnight. It was a unique plan because he could, if successful, neutralize McKnight, hide from Massinetti, and end up with Carla and a lot more cash than the $75,000 he now had. The one drawback to this plan was that he figured it only had a 30% chance of success. No, the best plan for him was obvious. Take the money he had on him and run, run and hide. He crumpled the napkin, stood, and walked out of the lounge like an ostrich looking for a hole. It took Anderson the better part of an hour to find where he had parked the car in the large seven-floor structure because he had paid no mind to the floor, the color, or space number when he arrived. He inserted the key in the door, opened it, and sat down in the driver's seat, slamming the door shut. Looking into the rearview mirror, he saw two dark silhouetted figures sitting in the back seat. Jesus! What the hell? Hands on the steering wheel, McKnight. And don't move or I'll blow your brains all over the windshield. Are you from Massanetti? Oh, come on. Don't you recognize my voice? It's me, Bishop. Oh. Uh, you. That's right. Just keep your hands on the wheel while my partner here frisks you. You care a piece, McKnight? You both know my name is Anderson. Whoops. <laughs> Looks like the Doc Super Drug wore off. Uh -huh. You just sit there real still. Uh, here we go. One pistol. Look at this, Bishop. Five spent cartridges. All blanks. You didn't catch on that you had blanks, huh? <laughs> I caught on. Too late. And what with all the excitement, I didn't have time to buy real ammunition. Well, it's a little late for that, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I bet you are. No, no, it's true. I've been kind of rooting for you to figure this thing out and escape us. I'm not very smart showing your face at an airport. And then hanging around for so long. Too bad. The wolf telling the rabbit that he's sorry to catch him. No, no, my partner was really hoping you'd get away. Just one of his many failings, which is why I'm getting a new partner after this thing's finished. 
Yeah, okay, Bishop. You just leave me out of this. I helped you get him. Let's settle for that and get on to business. What, um, business is that? Just relax, Anderson. Start the car and let's hit the road. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling me Anderson. Can I take my hands off the wheel now? Sure, sure, live. That's what I've been trying to do. And you do that very well. Survival, that is. It's just been dumb luck with an emphasis on dumb. No, no, you're pretty good. CIA material, I'd say. How did you find my car? The car salesman made your photo. We got here, saw you sitting in the lounge, found your car, watched and waited. SOP, standard operating procedure. Okay, no stalling, let's go. Okay, whatever you say. And no funny business at the ticket booth. Just pay for the parking without a word. You wouldn't want any minimum wage guy getting shot on your account. Jesus, Bishop. What? I think you're enjoying this a little more than you should be. Well, don't worry about that. Just be ready to shoot our friend here right through the seat if he gets any funny ideas. You hear that, Anderson? Right. No funny ideas. Where are we headed? Back to Washington. The Appalachians look different to Anderson in the daylight. Not so mysterious, not so beautiful. Just a bunch of rocks with a bunch of trees on them. They had driven a good 45 minutes with only Bishop and Lidecker talking in the back seat. It was bullshit CIA shop talk, but nothing about him, nothing about what would happen to him once they returned to Washington. And in fact, Anderson didn't want to know. But Anderson did want to know about Carla. Was she part of setting him up, or was she innocent as she had proclaimed? just a bystander caught up in this tragic conspiracy. He did want to know about that. If he was to die, he didn't want to die bewildered. What about the woman? What? He wants to know about Carla. What about her? What was her part in this? I mean, did she know that I was substituted for McKnight? You don't want to know. Go on, Bishop, tell him. Why worry about it? You had a nice piece of tail for a while. You should be grateful. Let it go at that. <laughs> I have to know. I'll tell you what. You tell me how Carla was in bed, and I'll tell you if she knew about you or not. Jesus! Do you mind keeping an eye on him while I get some sleep? This high school locker room stuff is too much for me. Sure, sure. Take a nap. Me and Anderson will have a nice little chat. Good. Wake me when we get near Washington. Will do. Okay, Anderson. You're on. You first. Before I tell you how she was, I want to know if her performances were real or not. Well, the answer's simple enough. Carla didn't know a damn thing about this setup. In fact, she was procured for this operation about six months ago. Procured? Yeah, we needed to get a hot chick to keep your mind occupied. So to convince you that you were really McKnight, we did a computer photo search of possible women we might use from the Department of Motor Vehicles' computer photo file. From those photos and personal data, we chose the woman that would most likely turn you on so hard that you wouldn't think about what was happening to you. That photo search led us to where Carla was working in San Diego, and we had someone offer her a bullshit translating job in CIA headquarters. Then McKnight picked her up and she moved in with him. And then one day, he told Carla that he was going on a mission. A few days later, I brought you to her in front of the hospital and she was none the wiser. What do you mean, a photo search? Yeah, we found your type. Your ultimate fantasy woman, so to speak. By doing a computer photo search. I don't have an ultimate fantasy woman. The hell you don't. Once, when you and your wife were out of your house, we photographed everything in it and found your fantasy. We got Carla out of your video collection. I don't have any adult videos. Yeah, I know. All your videos are historical documentaries. So what? I'm a history teacher. I use those in class. All but seven of them are historical documentaries. You're not making any sense. There were exactly seven videos that weren't about history, and it didn't take a rocket scientist to see what those seven movies all had in common. What movies? Now, don't tell me. I, I bet I can remember. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there's Flower Drum Song, of course. Uh, that plane crash movie with Glenn Ford and Rod Taylor, Fate is the Hunter. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that Disney movie, Lieutenant Robinson Crusoe. 
You bastards. Uh, the one with Pat Boone, uh, the main attraction. <laughs> that new one about Bruce Lee called Dragon, where she played the restaurant owner. All right, Star. Yeah, and of course, the one with uh, William Holden, the world of Susie Wong. Is that seven? And those movies all have one thing in you, common. You, mothers. The actress, Nancy Kwan. I'd like to burn down the CIA building with you in it. The first sensible thing I've heard on this whole drive. Don't you think it's funny that with all the drugs and technologies we have to probe people's subconscious minds, all we had to do in your case was to look at your video collection to find your dream woman. Simple as that. That's the photo search we did to find someone that looks like Nancy Kwan. And Carla surely does. Face, body. You son of a bitches. It wasn't enough to kidnap me and alter my face. You had to get into my mind, set me up with Carla to... To do what? Hey, hey, don't feel so special. We've done this many times in the past. Find a man's fantasy, dangle it in front of him, and he'll do anything to get it and hold on to it, distracting him from everything else. And you're, you're sure Carla didn't know anything about this? Hey, to her, you were McKnight. I guess until the drug wore off and you told her. I told her, all right. Now, what about Columbia? What about it? The drug raid, those three bandits. They were all fake setups. The drug raid was a fake. But those bandits were real. We almost lost you for real. God, all that work to set this thing up, and you almost getting killed by those three slime balls? That would have been a real waste of the taxpayers' money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Now it's your turn. Is she as hot as she looks? You want to hear about the first time we made it? Great. That, that'll that pass the time. And, and don't leave anything out. Jesus, do I have to hear this? You're supposed to be sleeping. Anderson began telling Bishop a fictional story about he and Carla, while half of his mind formulated an escape plan. Finally, he saw a sign which read Lone Tree Way, he turned the car onto the off-ramp. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? What's going on? I gotta take a leak, that's all. Hey, don't turn off. Stay on the highway. I gotta go bad. He's gotta go. I got him covered. You can hold it till we get to Washington. Just give me a minute. On the off-road, Anderson quickly found what he was looking for. A steep incline with no guardrail. He slowed down and crept the car to the edge of the cliff. In a quick do-or-die motion, Anderson opened his door and hit the lock button, trapping his two captors in the back seat. Lidecker pulled his gun, but it was too late. Anderson hit the moving ground, which sent him falling and rolling as the car nosed over the edge of the cliff and headed down the steep hill. Anderson got to his feet and looked over the cliff to see the car with Bishop and Lidecker trapped inside. The car quickly picked up speed. On its way down, it sideswiped boulders, knocked down small saplings, it bounced over rocks. The door's locked! Get over the seat! Get the wheel! Get him! Inside the car, the two agents made feeble attempts to climb over the front seat and get to the door locks. But the bumps and bounces kept them off balance and bouncing around inside the car. The car sideswiped a boulder that turned it on its side, causing it to roll end over end. Finally, it hit the bottom of the hill, coming to rest upside down with a fire starting in the engine. Uh, oh, Lidecker, are you all right? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm pissed off. What about you? Oh, God, just banged my head a couple of times. That's all. God, you smell gas. Of course I smell gas. We've been in a wreck. And if the gas hits the engine, we're toast. Shoot out a goddamn window. All right, here goes. Let's get the hell out of here. Oh, Jesus, we're on fire. Move over. Move over here. Follow me out. I'm with you. Hurry the hell up. Come on, Lightjacker. Move it. Move it. Get out. Get out of here. All right. Let's get away from this thing. Jesus. There it goes. God damn it to hell. How the hell did this happen? Don't ask me. I thought you had him covered. I did. You saw what happened. What did you expect me to do? Plug him before, before pulling off the road? We're supposed to deliver him alive. Yeah. And now we're not going to be delivering him at all. This thing is going to end up ruining my life. Or losing my life. 
Just look at that civilian up there looking down on us like, like he outsmarted us. Like he outsmarted us? He did outsmart us! Anderson! You stay the hell there, you son of a bitch! Well, there he goes. I guess he's not following your orders anymore. Let's get after him. How the hell do you think you're gonna do that? It's gonna take us a good half an hour to work our way back up the cliff. Do you think he's just gonna sit there and wait for us, do you? He's hightailing it out of here right now. And if he hitches a ride, he's long gone. And you and your guys and your plans are gonna get you a long prism term. Not just me, Lidecker. You're in this too, all the way, same as me. And if this scheme of the bosses turns out bad, you're gonna suffer the consequences, same as me. How do you figure that, Bishop? I got stuck with you as a partner. But I don't have to go against regulations. And I'll be damned if I'm gonna get caught holding the bag. Hold it, wait, now just back up a minute. What do you mean, partners? We're not partners. I'm your immediate supervisor, your boss, so as far as you should be concerned, I am the goddamned regulations. You take your orders from me just like I take orders. Uh, and what if I decide to go over your head? I don't think you'd get very far, because over my head is the guy who's running this operation. Oh, I mean higher than that. High enough to shut you all down. If you make any kind of report, it's always checked out before you get a meeting. Checked out with your immediate supervisor, me. And in that time, you'd get accidentally dead. And what if I accidentally shoot you right here, Bishop? What's the CIA line on an agent blowing the brains out of another agent? Yeah, you can pull that gun and cock it. But pulling the trigger, that'll make you dead soon after me, and you know it. No, I don't. I don't know it by damn sight. Put the gun away. You aren't gonna do anything. You're stuck in this. We all are. You've got family. Don't be a damn fool. You could threaten my family with a gun in your face? You're pretty good. I'll give you that. Oh, cool off, Lidecker. Your only choice is to ride this out like the rest of us. Ride it out. Get paid off and take a 30-day leave with your family intact. So put that away. Now let's find an easy way out of here. Jesus, God damn you, Bishop. Okay, I'll go along with the ride. I might even keep my mouth shut for the sake of my family. But I'm not doing the dirty work. You're gonna have to do that yourself. Hey, Mazzanetti's Goombas are gonna do the wet work. We just deliver the package. Deliver the package? The package just sent us on a hundred yard ride down a cliff. The package is laughing at us and is long gone. Well, then we'd best be getting to it, Agent Lidecker. Yeah, I guess so. Can't do much good standing in this ravine. Well, let, let's get the hell up there and hitch us a ride. Do you think anyone's gonna give the two of us a ride? I think so. After all, you're the one that's quick on the draw. That should stop a car or two. You know, I don't like you much, but I do have to say, you are one cool-headed mother. Stay in the CIA as long as I have, and you'll end up staying cool-headed, too. Uh, I doubt if I'll stay in as long as you. Yeah, well, looks like we can work our way up around over there. Right. Anderson had fast walked back down Lone Tree Way and reached the highway in a few minutes. Thumbing for a ride, his mind gave himself hell for getting caught so easily at the airport, for hanging around the airport too long for going to the airport with Carla in the first place. As car after car passed him by, he nervously looked over his shoulder to see if Bishop and Lidecker had somehow gotten up the cliff faster than he had figured, but they hadn't appeared yet. As insurance, he began to walk along the highway while thumbing. He gained solace in the fact that his jacket was holding about $75,000. At least he had made one smart move. In the law of survival, cash in a jacket can have more protection than a bulletproof vest. Finally, a beat-up pickup truck with an equally beat-up looking hillbilly behind the wheel slowed down and stopped. Taking a quick look back, Anderson did not see any sign of the two agents. He let out a silent sigh of relief as the driver rolled down his window. Where you headed, boy? Uh, my car broke down, so any place I can get a bus. Okay, hop in. Hell of a place to break down. That's for sure. Where were you going? Oh, I was trying to get to, uh, I mean, I was on my way to Atlantic City. Oh, 
Gonna do some gambling. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of that lately. You gamble much yourself? Uh, poker. With my friends. Not much casino stuff, though. Where are you headed? A small town in Virginia. Locust Grove. You know, I was just thinking out loud here, uh, but if I could go directly to Atlantic City, I mean, without a bus, it sure would be good for me. What do you mean? By airplane? No, well, no. I, uh, I've got business there more than gambling, and if I could get there sooner, for example, uh, uh, how far is Atlantic City from your town? Oh, no, Just no, for the sake no. of argument, now, if, if I were to give you, say, $500, how far would Atlantic City be from your town? Well, I'm not sure, but $500 how makes a little closer. How close would it be if I gave you $700? Cash money? Well, it's on me right now. <laughs> you know, Mr. Uh, uh, Anderson. Um, uh, you know, Anderson, I like the way you talk. <laughs> Now, if you were to make it, uh, say, an even thousand, Atlantic City would be right near my neighborhood. A thousand it is, if you drop me off at the boardwalk. For a thousand dollars, I'll carry you across the sand and drop you into the ocean. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll pay you an extra hundred for your gas and for you not to drop me in the ocean. <laughs> throw in an extra 50 for the toll bridge, and we'll get there quicker. I'll throw in an extra 200 for you to let me <laughs> jump in your back seat to sleep for a while. Yeah, and uh, what's that come to? Uh, 1,250. <laughs> You can keep the last 50 if you stop talking and pay me now. <laughs> <laughs> then you can jump in the back seat or, or any other goddamn place you want. Can you give me a receipt? <laughs> How about my gas receipts? <laughs> Will do, my man. I'll start counting it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Say, once we get there, you're not going to rob me and take it back, are you? <laughs> no, I'd need a gun for that. <laughs> you're not carrying a gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to, but it was full of blanks. <laughs> Hell, I'm shooting blanks myself these days. <laughs> Try some vitamin E. <laughs> this is the best goddamn hunting trip I've ever had. Yeah, what were you hunting? <laughs> Loose women in Charleston Park. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, <Jamming> what? <laughs> sure I did. That's why I'm broke and need your money. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for flying with us. On our final approach, please make sure your seat bags and trays are in their upright and locked positions, and any carry-on bags are stored on the floor beneath you. Carla had spent the entire one hour and 49 minute flight to Washington going over in her mind the events of the last few days. Events that became more confusing each time she thought about them. She had lived happily for the most part with James McKnight for three months. A week or so ago, he had informed her that he had to go out of the country on assignment, but would be back in a couple of days. Then, a few days later, Carla got a call from Bishop informing her that McKnight had been on a job and, even though he was healthy, was a little sluggish mentally, whatever that meant. Seeing McKnight coming out of the hospital, Carla had no reason to think that it was another man, that it really was this teacher named Anderson. Why would she? She expected to see McKnight, so she saw McKnight. Of course, there was a vast difference, but the difference, the gentleness, was welcomed. This Anderson guy was a brand new experience for Carla. McKnight had merely told Carla about the danger and the violence of his life. But with Anderson, she had experienced it firsthand. She'd seen the blood, she'd seen the body, she'd fled from the danger, and more than that, she had helped him. Anderson had been both an all-conquering gladiator and a child who needed her help. The child she had never had. When naked and standing bloody over his defeated enemies, he was a gladiator. Sleeping in the car while she was driving, he was her child. This was a strong combination for a lover of hers to be. As her plane came in for a landing, Carla thought about the night before at the hotel swimming pool. One minute she had been swimming with James McKnight, and the next she was with some stranger named Anderson. Life had never dealt her such a confusing dilemma. Now, as the plane taxied to the terminal, thoughts of Anderson began to fade away as thoughts of McKnight began to surface. Was he alive? 
What part, if any, did he play in this scheme? Did he still want her? Was she in danger? Carla came out of the gate with the rest of the passengers. She looked for McKnight subtly, not wanting to give away any of her thoughts should McKnight be there, or if someone from CIA was looking for her. She had to play it cool, had to play it smart. She was in the middle of something very serious and very deadly, but she had no idea what her role in it was, if any. Carla? Carla? Over here. Carla had always liked the way McKnight said her name. It was always like a friendly slap on her behind. But this time, it sounded more like a kick in the stomach. She turned and saw him standing tall in the crowd. McKnight waved his hand like a captain calling over a private. He wasn't smiling, but had a look of satisfaction on his face. Suddenly, Carla felt like running. Maybe she'd made a mistake by coming back. Jim, how did you know that I'd be here? You were spotted at the Charleston airport. You both were. What happened to him? Anderson, I mean. What's the matter? Are you worried about him? Look at me, Carla. Oh, I'm just so confused. Confused and tired. I thought that he was you. And then suddenly his memory came back, and he told me who he really was. It, it, it was frightening. What did you do when you found out it wasn't me? I didn't believe him at first. And then when I did, I was worried that something had happened to you. I was so scared, so I told him to take me to the airport. And I came back here to find out about you. I was going to go back to our place. Any baggage? No, none. Then let's go home. It was now clear to her that McKnight was completely in charge of this conspiracy. How else could he have known that she was on that flight? Yes, it was McKnight that was pulling all the strings, and Carla wondered if she, too, was just one of his puppets. Entering the condo with McKnight, Carla was at least happy to see that the glass in the sliding balcony door had been replaced, and there were new curtains. I missed you, Carla. I missed you a lot. Please, James, not now. I'm exhausted. Oh, come on. Don't give me that. I said I missed you. All right, Jim, but give me a minute. You don't need a minute. Come here. A full hour of abuse later, Carla lay face down on the bed, motionless, completely spent, completely used. For the first 20 minutes of their coupling, McKnight had been his usual self. But from then on, the passionate orders had become brutal commands. Power play verbalizations became degrading insults. Forced submissive positions became humiliating contortions. During it all, Carla knew exactly what McKnight was doing. He was punishing her body for its infidelity, even though her heart and mind had remained faithful to him. He was getting even with her for being with another man, even though to Carla, the other man was him. When he had finished, he quickly moved out of her and headed to the shower, muttering one word. Good. Carla gathered up what energy remained in her body and slowly rolled over and stared at the ceiling. With the shower water on, McKnight couldn't hear her mutter the words, Do that to me again, you bastard, and I'll stab you in your sleep. In the shower, McKnight had the water turned up as hot as he could stand it, and it felt great. He was happy to have Carla back. He had done nothing for the last six days but shack up in some suite at the Baltimore Hilton, frustrated with the news of Anderson's escape. However, all of that was in the past because Anderson had been caught by Bishop and Lidecker, and they would be bringing him back for the re-execution of Operation Sidewinder. And now he had Carla back here with him, too, ready to begin their new relationship. Here was a woman worthy of his energies to dominate. This job, and only this job, was the reason that Carla had been recruited, although unknowingly to her. She had been brought to CIA headquarters, picked up by McKnight, whined, dined, turned into his lover. But McKnight had no idea that he'd end up getting hooked on her. One thing he knew for certain, though, Carla could remain alive only as long as they remained lovers. 
Once he tired of her, she would have to be eliminated. Couldn't have her running off to the press or accidentally leaking any facts about Sidewinder. Of course, McKnight wouldn't do the job himself. He'd give that to Bishop as a sort of a bonus. But McKnight wouldn't be far away because when it came to killings, even ones that involved women, he was a natural voyeur. Without bothering to grab a towel, McKnight walked past Carla, who had still not recovered from his bludgeoning. He moved past her without so much as a sideward glance. Yes? Sorry to report that... That what? That what? That Anderson got away. How the hell did that happen? Well, we had a little car trouble and... Wait. I don't want to hear it. You know... I'm starting to think that I got the wrong goddamn man to handle this thing. Well, get a break soon. Anderson's an amateur. Constantly makes mistakes. I think it's you and Lidecker. You're the amateurs. Now you just find him right the hell now and call me back. Right. We're on it. Bishop, don't disappoint me again. That incompetent bastard... I should have given him more of a reaming than I did. Perhaps you used up all your reaming energy on me. Oh, that. That was just a little anger I had because of you and the school teacher being together. I told you I thought he was you. Still, you deserved it. How do you figure that? On the grounds that you should have known it wasn't me and for helping him drain my credit cards and for helping him escape what's coming to him, and for just being too goddamn uppity these last four months. You need to be taken down a few notches, if you're going to continue with me. Well, you took me down a few notches, forced me down a few notches, all the while pushing my head in the pillow so that I almost suffocated. Oh, that's what all that noise was about. I thought it was something else. You really are a bastard, aren't you? <laughs> and you really are a... Well, whatever you are. That's why we're so suited to each other. Yeah, I suppose so. Anyway, your boyfriend escaped from my agents. That should cheer you up while you're healing up. He's not my boyfriend. Well, anyway, I think you liked it with him. He's not like you. Nobody's like you, and I can't be blamed for what you set me up to do. I didn't set you up. You just happened to be here when this thing got started. But I think you're rooting for him. I got the first plane back to you when I found out the truth. Yet you treat me like an enemy, impale me like you're a priest in the Spanish Inquisition. Spanish Inquisition, ah. That would have been a fun time to be around for those of us in power. <laughs> I can imagine. But now, Carla, look at me. I need your help. Help get him killed? He was a dead man once he was chosen for this project. Was I chosen for this project? Of course not. It was just bad timing for you to get involved, like I said. How can I help you? Did Anderson tell you anything about his plans? Tell you where he was going? Just that he'll drive as far as he could and hide out in some small town. Yeah, and he's got $85,000 of mine to do it with, too. Well, anyway, it's good to have you back, Carla. It's, um... Good to be back, Jim. Anderson's ride led him off at the Atlantic City boardwalk. Bishop had inadvertently told McKnight that Victor Massanetti was staying at Caesar's Palace, so McKnight opted to check into the nearby Golden Nugget Casino Hotel instead. He went to the hotel shops and got a new suit, shirt, tie, and shoes. In his room, he took a shower and then carefully transferred his cash from the old suit to the new one while transferring his mind from the pursued to the pursuer, from the rabbit to the fox. He then left his room, took the elevator to the lobby, and walked out into the ocean air. 
With the conviction of George Armstrong Custer, he headed down the boardwalk to Caesar's Palace to his own little bighorn. But he was convinced that this time, Crazy Horse was gonna lose. Once inside Caesar's Casino, Anderson headed slowly but surely to the gaming table section, trying to act the part of a high roller. He did this by slowing and smoothing his walk and keeping a satisfied smirk on his face as if he had won at every other casino on the boardwalk. Caesar's would be no exception. Anderson approached a roulette table as the ball was winding down and heading for its bounce around the red and black numbers. He reached into his inside jacket pocket where he had positioned two $5,000 packs of cash in preparation for this first move of his, and he pulled them out. 10,000 on red. Sir, the maximum bet at this table is $500. Yes, I see the sign. Get it raised for me, would you please? Customer would like to place a $10,000 bet here. Okay, right. Yes, sir. That's a bet. Place your bet, sir. Red's the lucky one for me. Counting cash. The dealer began counting the bills under the watchful eye of the pit boss. The other players became excited at seeing so much cash on the table and placed their $5 minimum bets on the red to ride along with this stranger's balls of steel. The cash counted, the dealer placed a $10,000 marker on red. That's a bet. Good luck, sir. The dealer spun the ball as the pit boss eyed Anderson up and down. Anderson figured win or lose, he'd get the attention he wanted. And if this first bet didn't do the job, his next 10 grand bet would. The ball dropped down and bounced around before landing in its chosen slot. 34 red. The dealer paid off the small bettors first and then placed a $10,000 marker next to Anderson's other 10 grand marker. Anderson reached over, picked up the two markers and put them in his jacket pocket with the pit boss's eyes glued on him. He stood motionless as the other players placed their bets for the next spin. The pit boss gently elbowed the dealer. Place your bets, everyone. Anderson stood there as if he were posing for a portrait. Your bet, sir. Are you betting, sir? Anderson shook his head slightly with a polite smile. Slowly, he began to turn and look around the casino. Slowly, he began to edge away from the table. Slowly, he began to walk and pretend to search for the cashier's window to exchange his markers. Quickly, the pit boss came up to him. Sir, are you uh, planning to play more, or would you like me to cash in your markers? Um, I was thinking about uh, perhaps playing more a little later. Do you have a room here at Caesars? Uh, no, I don't. Well, sir, if you're staying in town for a while, perhaps we could offer you one of our luxurious rooms. Comped, of course. Would two nights be sufficient? Um, that sounds nice, but... Also, we'd like you to be our guest at our dinner show. That sounds nice, too. Yes, that would be nice. Well, if you wait here, I'll uh, call for a room key, uh, Mr... McKnight. James McKnight of the CIA. Yes, I see. Well, uh, welcome to Caesar's Palace, Mr. Big Knight. And if there's anything I can do for you, just ask me or anyone at the front desk. Well, there is one thing. Yes, sir? I would like you to arrange a game for me. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your pleasure? A poker game. That's fine. A poker game with Mr. Massonetti. Who, sir? At $5,000 a card. I'm sorry, Mr. McKnight, but uh, what is this all about? You have a Mr. Victor Massonetti staying here. I'd like to game with him. Well, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know the man. Well, this is Caesars in Atlantic City. <laughs> Somebody must know what room he's staying in. Just get the word to him that James McKnight of the CIA wants a game of five-card stud with him. I'm sure he'd like my high style of playing and... Be sure to tell him it would be one hand at 5000 a card. Okay, the CIA wants to see Mr. Massonetti. Is that correct, sir? Not the CIA, just me. James McKnight of the CIA. And just for a single hand, a five-card stud. 
I hope you don't think me rude for asking, but could I see some credentials? Uh, Mr. McKnight, is it? Well, I'm not here on official business, but if you give my name in association with the CIA to Mr. Massanetti, I'm sure he would want to sit down with me. Well, I, uh, I'm not at liberty, nor is Caesar's at liberty, to say who was a guest here or not. Uh, you can understand the problems that would cause if we gave out that kind of information to just anyone that asked for it. But seeing that this could be something that one of our guests is interested in, uh, I'll see what I can do for you, uh, uh, Mr. McKnight. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make some discreet inquiries, get the word out, so to speak, and if anything of that nature is possible, I'll let you know, say, in an um, hour or so. Thank you. And uh, while I'm checking on this, I would appreciate it if you didn't ask anyone else about it. It might cause some confusion. You can trust me that I'm handling the situation. So if you'd like to do more gaming or wait in your room, I'll give this my personal attention. I think I'd like to wait in my room for your call. Yes, sir. Just wait here and I'll get you your room key. Thank you. Anderson entered his high roller suite. The large room had floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the boardwalk, beach, and ocean far below. A half-spiral staircase led to a large loft which held a round king-size bed. He followed the stairs up to the bed and gratefully lay down on it. Hey, hombre, ¿qué pasa? Am I asleep or are you really here this time? Oh, I'm always really here. Every time, amigo. Tell me what you want, and then let me have a little good sleep while I can. You know this plan of yours? I don't think it's going to work. I mean, you're outnumbered, and you ain't smart as your enemies, I can tell you. My advice to you is to take that money in your jacket, leave this place, and find some hole to hide in. And, amigo, you should forget about the woman. She's too much for you to handle. I've been watching, and she's way out of your class. Okay, leave her out of it. Oh, no, amigo. You should be the one to leave her out of it. Yeah, hello? Yes, Mr. McKnight? Yes. Ah, uh, this is Mr. Carruth in the casino. I made some inquiries about your request. Yes, I remember. About that card game you requested with one of our guests? Yes. I was, in fact, able to find Mr. Massanetta. He's one of our very special guests. And between you and me, he was quite incredulous about you being here. Be that as it may, he is quite interested in a poker game with you. Good. I appreciate you setting that up. Well, he'll be waiting in his suite to receive you at your earliest convenience. He's in our Coliseum suite on the 33rd floor, room 3301. Thank you. I'll leave momentarily. Good luck, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Right. You're goddamn right about that. That's exactly what I need. Victor Mazzanetti had come up the hard way, and the easy way. The hard way being the life of a gangster, and the easy way because his father had been a big-shot racketeer in the early days with his own crew dealing in every aspect that organized crime had offered. When his father had fled to Sicily to escape prosecution on a murder charge in 1973, Massanetti took over the crew and, with brains and intimidation, expanded the organization to five times its size. Massanetti had had it all in the palm of his hand until last year, a few weeks after his 61st birthday. His son Frank had been arrested for possession of drugs with intent to deal. His conviction gave him a 10-year prison term. It was well known on the street that James McKnight of the Central Intelligence Agency had orchestrated the whole thing. Massanetti had put the word out that he would pay $100,000 for McKnight's head. Then suddenly, a week ago, Massanetti was contacted by an unknown person who said he could help set up McKnight for a fee of $50,000. The unknown person was Bishop of CIA. Bishop had guaranteed Massanetti that the security at McKnight's condo would be down enough for two of his men to get onto McKnight's balcony. After that, Massanetti was given a tip by Bishop that McKnight was holed up at the Sheraton Hotel. 
Massonetti sent another of his men to stake out the lobby. The hit would have been successful had it not been for a shopping mall guard. Massonetti had now lost three men and a lot of face on the McKnight hit with no success. But now suddenly, out of the blue, one of Caesar's pit bosses called his suite saying that James McKnight of CIA wishes to have a game of five-card stud with you. Disbelief was Massonetti's first reaction, but the description of McKnight given to him by the pit boss fit. So Massonetti gave the word to send McKnight to him. Now in his suite filled with hoods, babes, and smoke, Massonetti waited for the appearance of his number one enemy, James McKnight. <laughs> Jesus, boss, if that's him, I'm going to have a friggin' heart attack. Well, before you do that, will you go and open the door and see that you frisk him? And frisk him good. I always frisk him, boss. Check for an ankle gun. Right. Hey, Nino, qual è stronzo lì, vicino al muro? Che cazzo vuoi? Guardalo. Non so cosa sta facendo, ma lo sto tenendo d'occhio. Yeah, bud? What do you want? I'm James McKnight, here to see Victor Massonetti, I believe I'm expected. Well, right now you're expected to hold out your arms and stand still. It's the usual procedure. You packing? No, nothing. <laughs> A CIA man that ain't packing. That's unusual. I left it in my room, a token of my good intentions. Looking around the room as he was being frisked gave Anderson the chills. He wasn't expecting to see so many of Mazzanetti's henchmen. He had never seen such an assortment of beasts except on TV wrestling. It made singling out Mazzanetti nearly impossible. And acting the part of McKnight, Anderson figured that he should know him by sight. Not knowing him would tip off Mazzanetti that he was not who he claimed to be. He's clean, boss. McKnight, come in. Fortunately, the man that spoke was referred to as boss. This was Mazzanetti. The man sat in an overstuffed leather chair set slightly apart from everyone else, except for the blonde who was seated next to him. Yes, this had to be him. You got a lot of guts walking in here like this. Yes, I guess I do. And I intend to walk out of here with my guts intact. So I hear you want to play a game of poker. That's correct. Are you serious? Oh yes, very. One hand of five card stud, 5,000 a card. Why do you want to do that? Let's just say I could use the money if I win. And for you and me, it would, to all intents and purposes, make us a couple of buddies passing an evening over a game of poker. Buddies that can talk? Yes, exactly. Straight talk? That's why I'm here, poker and talk. Say, one of you guys uh, pulled that table over here. Pull it over here. Loro sono tanto stupido. Quanta volta devo repetire le questo una volta, dos, tre, quattro, cento, quanto? Pronto, boss. La sedia è pronta. Va bene qui il tavolo? Sì, sì, sì. Va bene, va bene. Adesso vai. Floyd, you deal the cards. Right, boss. And deal them straight. Yeah, sure, boss. And I mean straight. If I find out that you've been mechanicing, I'll have Carmine throw you out of the window. <laughs> Every card will be straight off the top, I swear. So, McKnight, pull up a chair. A raise is okay in this game of yours? I guess so. You got enough money to cover this kind of action? I believe I have enough to stay in the game. It's right here in my jacket. Okay. This is Floyd. He'll deal straight, just like you heard me tell him. Sounds good to me. Hey, one of you guys, get me my briefcase. Eccola qui. I got the ready cash to take care of any and all wages right here. I guess we're going to start our little game now. Ready? I think so. Shall we ante up? Ante up? We've got to ante up something to get the game started. So it might as well be um, five grand. A $5,000 ante. Well, that's in case that you, uh, you know, you fold on the first card. <laughs> or in case you do. 
Don't worry. I'm not folding. No matter what. We'll see about that. Here you go. Okay, the pot's right. Ten grand in. Gentlemen, as we agreed, this is five card stud. One down, four up. And as agreed, the bet will be 5,000 a card. You can check and raise. And also, this will be just one hand. Good luck, gentlemen. Five of spades to Mr. M. Six of diamonds to Mr. McKnight. Six of diamonds bets. Here's my five. Here's your five and up five. Welcome to a uh, big time poker. I hope you have enough to stay, to stay in the game. If I get the cards to stay in the game, then I'll stay in. McKnight, why did you come here? To play. Maybe you'd better play a, a little louder. And how about the next card? You heard the man, Floyd. King of diamonds to the boss of bosses. Eight of diamonds to the CIA. King of diamonds bets. King of diamonds says 5,000. And you know what? I think you came up here to offer me something. Is that right? Like maybe, maybe some money. Yes, I came here to offer you something, but something more personal than financial. Interesting. Just uh, keep talking. Let's keep dealing. What do you say? Next card, Floyd. Fourth card coming out. Pair of fives for Mr. M. Seven of diamonds to the government. Possible flush. Hey, possible straight flush. Silencio, troppo rumore. Devo pensare prima de giocare. Pair of fives bets. Check to the possible. Possible straight flush says 10,000. If you don't mind raising the limit a tad. Well, here's your 10. And 10,000 more back at you. So, this personal offer you speak of sounds, uh, sounds interesting. I think you'll be interested, very interested. I am listening. Pot's right. It's hard to talk when the suspense of the next card is killing me. It may not be the suspense, or even the next card that kills you. Because you know, McKnight, the reason you might not walk out of here like you did at the mall could be a bullet from my gun. I'd rather it be from you than from one of your men. Oh, would you really rather have that? Actually, I'd rather see the next card. Okay, Floyd. Give us our last card. Nine of clubs to Mr. M. Queen of spades to our G-man. <laughs> Busted. No straight, no flush. I guess that's it for you. You got a six, seven, and eight of diamonds lying next to a black queen. It's not very intimidating. You might be surprised when I show you my whole card. I checked to the Black Queen. The Black Queen of Spades is $10,000. Well, what have we got here? A bluff artist who wants me to think that he has a pair higher than my fives. A pair of queens, maybe. If you want to see my whole card, the looking price is another $10,000. If you think I'm gonna fold with that much cash over in the pot, then you must think I'm crazy. Here's your 10 grand, and up 10 grand. That's $110,000 in the pot right now. Seems right. It's exactly right. 110,000. That's 10,000 to you if you want to stay in. Can your jacket afford it? It can. I've got enough and more. Then make the pot right or fold. I can make things right very right for you, so right that you'll love it. Oh, and just how are you gonna do that? By delivering to you someone that you hold very dear. And here's your 10,000 and I up you another five. When would this, um, 
delivery happen? Oh, say in 72 hours. You mean, Frank, you talking about my son? That's right. You'll get him out of the slammer? Yes. Do you have the, the power to do that? You know I have the power to arrange just that. And I, uh, lift the contract on you. You go scot-free, and I never go after you again. That's what I want, yes. That would be very acceptable. That's 5,000 to you, boss. I think you're trying to buy the pod, McKnight. I don't think you have a pair of anything. I think you were going for the straight, and now you're busted. I know my fires have got you beat, so I'm going to go easy on you. I'll just call you. You're calling me? That's right. Tell me again when that delivery will happen, when I'll see my son Frank. Like I said, in 72 hours, there'll be a friendly knock on the door. And you can really make this happen. Not easily. I have to call in a lot of markers, but it will happen. We're talking about my son. Yes, and my guaranteed safety. Good, good. Then we've reached an agreement. In that case, beat my two fives. My whole card is a seven. A pair of sevens. Jesus, you're one lucky player. Try for straight. Busted, try for a flush, busted, and get a pair of sevens. Just lucky, I guess. I figured I was due for some luck. You don't call that luck? Surviving my men at your condo? And my man at the mall? Oh, that. That was my CIA training. Yeah, right. So just one hand, huh? No chance me getting my money back. One hand is what we agreed on. Well, I always keep my agreements. Do you? I do. I always do. 72 hours. In that case, don't waste your time hanging around here. Take your winnings and leave. Give him a bag, Floyd. Since we're not likely to ever play another hand of poker, I have to tell you that I never bluff. The hell you don't, McKnight. The hell you don't. Mr. Massonetti. Gentlemen, ladies, with your permission, I'll get started on our agreement. I'll be waiting right here, waiting for the... Good news. You won't be disappointed. With the bag full of money in hand, Anderson turned slowly. The spectators between he and the door parted. The 30 feet to the door seemed an eternity as Anderson slowly walked them. One of the men opened the door and Anderson walked out into the hallway. He walked slowly to the elevator, listening for the door to Mazzanetti's suite to close. Finally, it did. He looked behind him to see if anyone was following him, but he was alone in the hall. He let out a long sigh of relief and headed toward the elevator. In his suite, Massanetti was being consoled by his gang as he remained seated lighting up a cigar and puffing it. Sorry, Miss Dam. You told me to deal it straight and I did. It's okay, Floyd. I made the deal I wanted. The money he took was just an extra incentive for him to get Frank out of prison. Only that is important, nothing else. Just remember, sometimes when you lose, you really win. Hey, if that money will get your son out of prison, then it's good you lost. I never lose. Massanetti reached over to his hole card and flipped it over with a snap, revealing a third five. In his room a few floors below Mazzanetti's, Anderson dumped the contents of the bag onto his bed. The packs of cash gave him the courage to do the next step in his plan before he would allow himself the sleep that he much needed. The next step was to make a phone call to his number one enemy, James McKnight. Yes. McKnight? 
Who is this? I'm you, or I used to be. Just tell me who you are, or I'm hanging up. You know it's me, McKnight. Lawrence Anderson, the sitting duck with your face. How did you get this number? I'm learning how to play your game. A few more weeks of this, I'll be CIA qualified. What do you want? You owe me. With all the money you took off my credit cards, I think it's the other way around. You owe me more than that. How do you figure? Because you killed me. You burned me up in my car, made my wife a widow, and now my life is over. You sound alive to me, pal. And how long will that last with all the mafia and CIA agents you've sent after me? I don't know what you're talking about. Quit stalling. You don't have to keep me on the line to trace me. I'm in Atlantic City. So you're in Atlantic City. Why are you calling when you should be running? I want you to set things right. How can I do that? A hundred thousand dollars for starters. Are you crazy? Why would I give you anything, let alone that much money? Well, there's an answer to that. If you don't give me the money, the next time you see me, we'll be on as many news and talk shows that will take me. Believe me, I have documented proof of what you did to me. It'll put you on the hot seat for life, not to mention the meeting I just had with Victor Massonetti. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You met with Massonetti? Well, it's more like you met with Massonetti. That's what I'm doing here in Atlantic City. I have a room here. Massonetti and I are neighbors. He thinks that he just met with you, McKnight of the CIA, and, oh, the things you promised him. You should have been there. Well, you were, but you weren't. Get it? Boggles the mind, doesn't it? Don't push me, you civilian. And don't you get smart with me. You don't know what you're dealing with. So if you don't want me on the news or want Massonetti really pissed off with you, I think you'd better get that 100000 delivered to me on the boardwalk outside Caesars by 3 p.m. tomorrow. And what's to stop me from ordering your brains to be blown out on the boardwalk at 3 p.m. tomorrow? In front of all the tourists? That's rather tacky, even for you. All right. Just come clean. What have you got up your sleeve? My sleeve? You wouldn't be talking to me this way unless you had something. Something more than the news shows at Mazzanetti. Oh. Oh, that. You mean the 20 videotape copies that my new lawyer in Atlantic City is holding? The ones that are in 10 envelopes addressed to newspapers, TV stations, my wife, my college, the FBI, the CIA, and a few other places that you definitely don't want them to go. What the hell kind of a video did you make? My lawyer videotaped me telling the story of how I was kidnapped by these very bad men from the CIA and how I was given the identity of James McKnight and set up to be killed. Also, in the video, I hold up your driver's license, credit cards, and CIA ID. It's a very convincing video, trust me. You bastard. Do you realize what you've done? I know exactly what I've done. And if my lawyer doesn't get his weekly phone call from me, he'll mail out all 20 copies except the one he'll keep to make more copies and use to start proceedings against you. You planned it pretty goddamn well, didn't you? I'm learning. Sort of on-the-job training. Okay, okay. You'll have your money. Just don't do anything stupid with those videos. There's one more thing. Really? What is it? Have Carla deliver the money. Jesus. Is that what this is all about? Don't tell me you got hooked on her. Hell, you stupid Indiana hick. She was part of this deal all along. No, she wasn't. Bishop filled me in on that. I don't care what Bishop said. Carla knew what she was doing. Maybe she did and maybe she didn't. But just have her deliver the money alone and tomorrow at three, boardwalk in front of... Caesars, I know. Now, look, I just want you to know you're in over your head if you're stuck on Carla. 
She's way out of your league. You know that, don't you? Not that I blame you. She's a great piece of work. But take my advice. Leave Carla out of this. Take the money, pal, and run for the hills. No, no, no. You take my advice, and don't disappoint me or the videos will start flying. Well, well. Guess who's trying to play hardball? I heard. Yeah, your boyfriend. Sounds like he's getting serious. He's serious about you, that's for sure. And how about you? Are you serious about him? I'll do whatever you want me to do. That's right. That's goddamn right. You will. And you're gonna love it, whether you like it or not. Yes. Yes, I will. Ten minutes after three, still no Carla, still no hundred grand. But Anderson was still alive, and that thought sustained him, except for a slight desire to drown himself in the Atlantic to stop the tension. But he knew that feeling would surely pass because self-extermination now seemed ludicrous to him. Anderson was now standing on the boardwalk, keeping an eye peeled for Carla. He was also keeping an eye out for anyone looking like a CIA agent or a mafia hitman. Slowly out of the crowd of overweight, underdressed tourists emerged a vision of beauty. Carla outshone the sun even without smiling. In her left hand, she was carrying what looked to be a McDonald's takeout bag. Anderson was positive it was the cash because Carla for sure hadn't lowered her standards for a decent meal. Carla didn't see Anderson, but with the crowd and his standing in the shadows. She walked over to the railing of the boardwalk found an empty bench and sat down holding the McDonald's bag in her lap. The coast literally looking clear, Anderson stepped out of the shadows and began walking across the boardwalk to where Carla was sitting. Halfway there, she noticed him coming out of the crowd. Her face showed recognition, but no other expression. He motioned her to remain seated and he sat down next to her. A McDonald's bag, cute. Is it all there? I hope you live to spend this money, because I think you're crazy for doing this. Well, I think so, too. But I can't turn back now. Is there really a hundred thousand in there? Yes, it's all there. And it's real. And it's unmarked, as far as I know. But do you really expect to walk away with this bag? McKnight probably has men watching us right now. Yes, you're probably right. Why didn't you run and hide with the money you had? I mean, why are you risking this? It can't be just for the money. Partly, it is. But I really have no other choice with everyone on the planet after me. Sooner or later, I'll start my car and a mafia bomb or a CIA bomb will kill me. I need it to make this video with a lawyer, at least to give myself half a chance. And... And what? I hope it's not what I think it is. I wanted to talk to you again. Don't you know the trouble you're causing me? The jeopardy you're putting me in? Look, let's talk indoors. I think that McKnight will honor my deal, especially because of the videos, but I can't be too careful. You're not careful at all. Did you really get a lawyer? I mean, do those videos really exist? Um, no. I'm pulling a bluff on that. You really are crazy to do that. Oh, I don't know. I'm getting good at bluffing lately. If my luck holds out long enough, I can pull off this bluff and get out. Well, good luck. But I have to talk with you. Give me 15 minutes in my room. McKnight is expecting me back to Washington on the 5.30 flight. Well, I guess I have 15 minutes. Good. Come on. Do you, uh, need something to drink or anything? No, nothing. Okay, here's the deal. I've got this 100000 from McKnight... Plus, I have about $75,000 left from his credit cards. Yeah, and he's angry about that as well, especially since I helped. And I won $65,000 off Massanetti in a poker game. What? Are you joking? You played poker with that gangster? When? <laughs> Yesterday. Beat his two fives with a pair of lucky sevens. No joke and no time to explain. So that's a total 
of $250,000, quarter of a million. That's what we have. What do you mean, we have? Well, um, um, okay, here goes. I was thinking that we got along well in the past few days, even with all the excitement. We had something that felt really comfortable. Look, you don't want to do this. I know you thought I was someone else, that I was him, but it was me too. No, you, you should stop. This guy that works for McKnight, this guy Bishop, told me that you were handpicked for this thing, this conspiracy. You were chosen to keep my mind occupied until they killed me. What are you talking about? Anyway, I thought that once... You knew that. You might want to rethink your relationship with McKnight or maybe even want to escape with me. Bishop told you that? Yes, it's the truth. You've been used, set up just like me. Look, I, I, I've got an escape plan worked out, and we've got some cash that'll last a long time. You can stay with me as long or as short as you want. I'll pay for everything and give you personal expense money for every week you stay. We shared some good moments together. We can share more. Sharing a bed? More than that, at least on my side. But the main thing is that you are in danger. Once they're through with you, you can guess what might happen. And what if I don't want to go with you? Then I'll give you, say, 50000 right now, so if you want to leave McKnight and get away on your own, you can. You'd really do that for me? Of course. Reach in the bag and pull out half. You're serious, aren't you? Yes. Come with me. I think I'd better. But give me the 50000 now, like you said. <laughs> so I can have it. And you pay for everything. I'll go with you. Stay with you for a while anyway. Good. Good. Grab your half out of the bag and put it in your purse. Right. Where do we go from here? Used car lot again. So, is this turning out like you planned? It's turning out better, much better. But once we hit the road, we're then going to... Hold it! Stand Stand still, still, nobody move! Stand still! Hold it! Oh, Jesus. It's over for you now, you smart-ass son of a bitch. Now sit down, both of you. All clear! Surrounded by eight Central Intelligence agents with Bishop in the lead, backed up by Lidecker, Anderson and Carla sat down on the sofa. Bishop repeated, All clear, as he looked toward the busted open door. After a few seconds' wait, James McKnight walked in, backed up by still another agent. Anderson couldn't take his eyes off of him. It was disconcerting to see one's reflection without the use of a mirror, especially when your own reflection was out to get you killed. His reflection looked down at him and then over at Carla and then back at him again. You mess with a bull, you get the horn. What are you doing here, McKnight? I thought we had a deal. I don't deal with people who steal from me. You stole my whole life from me. Oh, I'm sorry about that. But you were needed and your face fit the bill. Jim, can I leave? Ah. Uh, I don't think so, Carla. I mean, your actions. You being in this room really disappoints me. You were to deliver the money and hop a plane back to Washington. I mean, seeing you in this Hicks room gives me pause. Is this what America's come to? Taking anything it wants from its own citizens? Oh, please, please. Spare me the classroom lecture teacher. The government isn't involved in this operation. I'm running the whole show. Are you going to tell me what this operation is about? Why you put me, Carla, and God knows who else through this? I thought you had that figured out. Not clear. Not exactly. Chief, we got your man for you. Do I have your permission to withdraw? Stick around, Agent Lidecker, and the rest of you. We'll have this wrapped up in no time. You see, Anderson, you're needed to facilitate my retirement. Mazzanetti wants me dead, so do a few others, and I don't want to look over my shoulder for the rest of my life. 
I'll let Mazzanetti think I'm dead by him killing you. And then I can go into my own retirement protection program. My agents here are all getting paid nicely to keep their mouths shut. So that ties up everything in a neat little package. Why in hell don't you just fake your death and put it in the obituaries? Because the men that are after me are smarter than that. The mafia wants pictures and parts of my dead body to put on their dartboards. They won't give up searching for me until then. And that's where I come in, huh? An innocent man getting a guilty one off the hook. Not that it matters, but I've earned what you're doing for me. In Da Nang and Honduras, so this conversation is over. I told you that if I don't check in with my lawyer now and again, he'll assume I'm dead and send out those videos. You know, I've got my own ideas about those videos. What idea? They don't exist. Believe me, McKnight, those 20 videos exist, as well as copies of your various IDs. Prove it. If they exist, let's see one of those videos right now. Looks like there's a video player right over there. How about it? Sure. If you really need the proof, I'll call my lawyer and have him send over a copy by messenger. We'll have it here in 30 minutes. Yeah, you do that. I really want to see what you have, if you have it. And I don't believe you do. But you've got 30 minutes. Call him. Call your so-called lawyer. All right. Jim, this is too much. Let me out of here. I I'll wait for you in the lobby. Can't do it, Carla. You're too much of a liability now. What if he doesn't have the videos? Then we wrap up Operation Sidewinder right here and now. Oh, I have them. Yes. You know who this is, don't you? Yes. Put the man on now. I want to talk to him. So, yes, it's me again. I'm still in my room at Caesars. And I just FedExed the money I won from you to a judge that will make sure your son, Frank, never gets Jesus, paroled. get the hell He'll off that He'll serve phone. every one of those 20 years. A two-bit gangster like you can't beat me, James McKnight of the CIA. Jesus. Screw you, Massanetti. Stop it, Jim. You bastard. I'll kill you for this. And ruin your own plan? In his suite after slamming down the phone, Massanetti was furious. Ten of his men gathered around him. They knew when he was pissed off, heads were going to roll. That CIA bastard is in his room. I want him dead. Three shots in the head. And he's probably not alone, so take the night shift boys with you. The hoods walked out of the room with orderly determination. In the hall, Floyd pounded on the room next door, arousing the night shift, which consisted of seven more of Massanetti's guerrillas. Two floors below, McKnight picked up Anderson off the floor by his throat. What did you do? Chief Crazy Horse is about to attack Little Bighorn. Are you talking about Mazzanetti? Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's the Italians who'll be storming this place. As for me, I'm safe. You see, me and Mazzanetti are friends. We play poker together. You goddamn son of a bitch! I think we better start an immediate evac, boss. I get a feeling it's a little too late for that. All right, take him out of here. Carla, get up and move to the door. Bishop, Lidecker, take the man and start setting up protection in the hall. Everyone turned to see the door fly open like the break in a dam with a wave of gangsters running and shooting. With their guns already drawn, McKnight's agents made quick work of the first three as a hail of bullets greeted the intruders. McKnight let go of his grip on Anderson and pulled his own gun. Bishop and Lidecker drew their guns, turned over the dining room table, and fired as the gangsters continued to run and crawl into the suite. Anderson jumped to his feet, grabbed Carla, and moved her behind the sofa, covering her with his body. McKnight moved over near the staircase and fired at two attacking gangsters, dropping them to the floor, dead. Other agents began taking hits that crippled or killed them, quickly lessening the number of CIA combatants. Bishop moved up from behind the table to take a shot at a gangster, but received three bullets in his chest. He fell dead behind Lidecker. Lidecker carefully got a shot off and killed one of his boss's slayers. Failing to see a gangster on his left, Lidecker took a bullet in his shoulder and leg before hitting his assailant in the head with a single shot. 
McKnight moved halfway up the staircase and fired down on the sea of human slime that still poured into the room, killing two of them and wounding another. McKnight's remaining men now totaled only five. Of the 13 gangsters, four were dead and one was wounded, all within the first 15 seconds of the siege. The gangsters had five of their men alive in the room with six more in the hall that were running into the room firing, seeking cover and CIA targets. Two agents stood up trying to hit their marks but received hot mafia lead in their faces for their efforts. This left McKnight with three men plus himself to cope with the remaining bad guys. Lidecker took a second hit in the same shoulder, dropping him back to the floor. Another agent took two in the stomach, incapacitating him to the point of dropping his gun, which bounced just a few feet from the sofa where Anderson and Carla were hiding. Another agent caught a bullet in the side and then in the hip, which infuriated him so much that he came limping out from behind cover, yelling and firing, taking two gangsters with him to whichever hereafter life he was headed for. Anderson saw his chance and made a grab for the gun that was near him. A quick lunge earned him the weapon. Gunfire, weapon flame, and smoke filled the room as well as the screams of pain from the final agents and gangsters who were killing each other. McKnight came down from the stairs to reposition himself and took a hit in the side by a gangster near the entrance. The gangster stood for a killing shot but was cut down by a final standing agent. However, the last agent suddenly received a bullet in his head with sledgehammer shock causing his hair piece to fly through the air like a terrified raven trying to escape the carnage. McKnight put a bullet into the final gangster who had been screaming in pain and yelling obscenities in Italian. The room was now quiet. Anderson grabbed Carla to make a run for the door. McKnight moved toward him and hit him on the back of his head with the butt end of his weapon. Anderson fell, stunned to the floor. McKnight grabbed Carla by the wrist and swung her around behind him. A powerful backhand oh. knocked her to the floor as well. Oh. Look what you've done, you crazy goddamn schoolteacher. You did this, and you're going to die for it right now. Carla scooped up the gun from the floor and aimed it at the back of McKnight's head. Don't move, Jim. One move or one word, and it's your turn to take a reaming. Behind her, Lidecker got painfully to his feet, holding his pistol at his side. Don't do it, Carla. I'll hold him here. You and Anderson, make a run for it. Shut the hell up, Lidecker. This isn't about them. This is about us and the CIA. This isn't about the CIA. This is about you. You and all of us that you pushed into this. Carla, put the gun down and get out of here. Don't you move, Carla, or your boyfriend dies. Ah, oh, hell, Jim. The bullet fired from Carla's pistol entered the back of McKnight's head and exited his mouth, sending teeth flying. The bullet hit a mirror on the wall, shattering it to pieces, and McKnight's corpse fell onto the glass-covered floor. Carla dropped the pistol and grabbed the McDonald's bag. Anderson rose to his feet. The two of them headed to the door. Wait, Carla. Carla and Anderson stopped in their tracks. They turned and looked back at Lidecker standing in the middle of the carnage, bleeding from his shoulder. He had his pistol at hip level, but quickly let his arm hang down. What do you want? What's your plan? We'll run and hide. Good. I'll blame this all on Massinetti and McKnight. Stay out of sight for a couple of years or so. I intend to. Go on, take off. This is the second time you've saved me, Agent Lidecker. Thank you. It was Carla who did the shooting this time. But you're the one letting us go. Right. So take off. Stepping over bodies, Anderson and Carla made it to the door. Just before entering the hall, Anderson looked back into the room. He saw Agent Lidecker standing amongst the dead bodies and smoke, holding his wounded shoulder, Gun still in his hand at his left side. Was that a slight smirk on Lidecker's lips as he gave Anderson a final short nod? Anderson wasn't sure, but seeing the tall, strong figure of Lidecker standing bloody amongst the bodies gave Anderson the feeling he was exiting the Alamo just before Davy Crockett fell. However, Lidecker had no intention of falling, not falling from life or falling from grace in the CIA. He was already thinking up a cover story to tell his superiors, a story that would not only explain what he was doing there, but probably garner him a citation for heroism under fire. 
Anderson and Carla waited for the elevators arriving from the higher floors. The doors opened. Without looking at the six or so people who were there, they entered as calmly as possible. The doors closed. Anderson looked around and surveyed the people in the car with them. Standing behind a middle-aged tourist couple, he saw Massinetti and Floyd staring at him. Floyd was about to point and speak, but Massinetti elbowed him in the ribs, stopping Floyd's words. Massinetti and Floyd stared at Anderson and Carla all the way to the lobby floor. When the doors opened, Massinetti motioned Floyd out. They quickly entered the casino and were soon lost in the crowd. Anderson and Carla walked slowly to the boardwalk exit and left the building. General Custer and 225 troops crossed the Little Bighorn right down there. Chief Crazy Horse and 3,000 Indian Braves pinned Custer up against that hill. Right over there, see it? Mm-hmm. Custer and his men were strung out in the open. No way to escape. Wave after wave of Comanches came down, buried the 7th Cavalry. According to many Indian reports, Custer's men fought bravely. And not one of them survived, like the story goes? Custer and all his men died on that very spot. Nobody survived. Oh, well, we survived. What do you say that we settle for that? Yeah, let's settle for that. It's all very interesting to be at another massacre location. I guess. Well, um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, uh, anyway, it wasn't too far out of our way. Well, Custis Last Stand should be required reading for anyone going up against the CIA like you did. I didn't go up against them. I just survived them. No, no, no. You could have run, but you didn't. You bluffed your way through to the end. I think I overplayed my hand and just got lucky. Like with you. That is, if I have you. Mm. So, what's next on the tour? Another historical site? No. This is enough. I'm satisfied. It's onward to Seattle. Well, I guess Seattle should be an okay place to hide out till the heat's off. I don't know if the heat's ever going to be off with Massinetti seeing us in the elevator. It was reported that James McKnight was killed at Caesars in a shootout with gangsters. Well, um, what's he going to believe? The papers are seeing us in the elevator. Hmm, I guess you're right. Hiding out for a long while, it's better. Hide out together. For a while, anyway. Until the money runs out. Uh-uh-uh. Until your money runs out. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair enough. And what happens after that, with you and me? Are you sure you want to know? Well, no. Actually, I don't want to know the future. I'll just concentrate on the present, with you. Yeah. What about your other life? I mean to say... Your life in Indiana? My life in Indiana? <laughs> I guess that's history. <laughs> This has been the KM production of McKnight's Memory, performed by Robert Culp, Nancy Kwan, 
David Hedison, Don Stroud, H. M. Wynett, Barbara Lee, Gary Lockwood, Alan Young, Ed Burns, Julian Scott Urena, and Henry Silva as Massonetti. Narrated by Frank Sinatra Jr. Recorded by Jeff Robeff at Victory Studios in Hollywood. Sound design by Ellis Berman. Music supervision by Frank Sinatra Jr. Produced by Larry Metzger. Written and directed by Paul Curiazzi.